get going with the rules. All right, great. I'll go ahead, Daniel. Thank you. Of course. Welcome committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to today's Legal Services Trust Fund Commission Partnership Grants Committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. To use the raised hand feature by phone, dial star nine on your phone's dial pad. Uh, you use star nine to both raise your hand and the same to lower your hand. Please utilize this tool to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. Going forward, all commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar website. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Finally, some quick troubleshooting tips for those using Zoom on a computer. When on mute, holding down the space bar will temporarily unmute you. If you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, they can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, let's do roll call. Great, Eric Iskin? Here. Will Bacelli? Present. Susan Galpin? Here. Anna Cruz? Lee, Christina Venerelli. Here. Sorry. Um, our advisor, Judge Jaskol. Uh, our liaisons, uh, Selena Copeland, uh, Bonnie Huff, Melanie Snyder. Then I'll just do state by staff quickly. Elizabeth Hom. Here. Uh, Danielle McGregor. Here. Uh, Dan Pasmanic. Here. And Colleen Sita. Here. All right. All right. We have quorum. Okay, terrific. So are there any members of the public in the meeting? No. Okay. Well, hearing none, then I guess there won't be any public comment. Um, all right. So can we move on to uh, the consent items? And the first one would be uh, approval of the meeting summary and action items from our November 4, 2021 meeting. Um, any comments on that? Concerns, questions, thoughts? If not, I will move approval. Any seconds? I will. Thanks, Christine. All right, I'll take roll call vote, Eric. Yeah, roll call vote for this motion. Um, Iskin? Yes. Basali? Yes. Falcon? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Benali? Yes. All right, motion passes. Okay, terrific. All right, let's move on to the, the action items. And then for folks on the call today, uh, my objective here is, you know, I don't want to foreclose discussion on anything, but let's try to move quickly through some of the preliminary items. The heart of today's meeting is really going to be the calibration of our, our sample uh, proposals here. So I want to really reserve time for that. All right, but let's move on to uh, item 4A. Uh, Eric, may, may uh, I interrupt for a moment? Um, could we just introduce one of our newest staff members who's joining us for the first time today? Yeah, So that, that, uh, so that the com committee is aware. Sure. Uh, so Colleen Sito, she uh, just joined um, our staff on Monday, and so she'll just be sitting in to observe, but she will be part of the partnership grant uh, staff review team. And so uh, many of you will have the opportunity to work with her. So Colleen, um, can you, uh, do you want to just say hi? <laughs> hi, sure. Good morning. My name is Colleen Sito. I've just joined the State Bar of California as a program analyst with the Access and um, the Office of Access and Inclusion. And I am looking forward um, to working with everyone. Thank you. And yeah, Colleen okay. will be based in um, our LA office. Oh. And comes, yeah. to, and comes to us with um, many, many years of grants administration experience. So we're really thrilled to have her on and um, appreciate the, the little interruption in the agenda to be able to introduce her. Wait, Thanks, I'm, I'm sorry, you said many, many years of what experience? Grants administration experience. Mm, great, terrific. Well, welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, so let's move on to item 4A. Sure, so I have, I'll, I'm sharing my screen right now, so I'll 
uh, make this larger. So this is 4.8, the uh, 2021 budget re the revision request. Just for some context, um, the committee did uh, look at a number of requests at its last meeting in November. This is just a reminder of um, what the approval process looks like. Uh, we did have a late sub budget submission request from San Luis Obispo Legal Assistance Foundation. The deadline was October 29th, um, and then the budget re request was submitted on November 12th. Uh, because it is, uh, according to the approval process, over 25%, it requires a committee review uh, for the Trust Fund Commission's approval um, at its next meeting. So, um, here is the budget revision request of the amount that they're looking to revise. As a reminder, a budget revision request um, is not is not requesting monies uh, to be spent in the next year. It's it's really uh, rearranging the uh, previously allocated items in um, in, an, in a grantees. Uh, budget that was confirmed. Uh, this is typically due uh, due to because um, things in the projects may have changed over the year. As you know, the budgets are proposed. So a lot of the programs do submit this just to ensure that it does reflect actual expenses. Uh, majority uh, of the reason for or for moving this amount of money around was to cover personnel costs, uh, which we uh, typically uh, do approved. So just going through the approval process for this um, late budget revision, um, uh, for the committee's uh, consideration today. So Crystal, it says 63% or 63.7%. So you, they're not spending any more money, right? They're just moving no. the allocated amount from one bucket to another, yes. essentially. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't impact um, any allocations. Of the money has been, um, the, the grant year um, has ended on December 31st. This is just a, a formality for when they submit the evaluations and just to make sure that the alloc allocated amounts was consistent and they did go through the process of, of getting it approved. Um, it, it looks like a large number. It's just because we, we look at the individual variances. If they've moved so many from non-personnel to personnel, we, we add it up and that's how we, we get, get that uh, percentage at the in the last column. Uh, so their explanation is here. And then there's a motion on the next screen if there's no questions. I don't get I it. Do. So they're still getting the same amount, the 98. Yeah. And then yeah. the 62 is just <coughs> pulled out the ones that moved from this line to that line type. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very different than the carryover request, which, yeah. was, which is a bigger deal. This is definitely just moving stuff around and you have to find a way to calculate it. Um, and that's, that's the, the methodology. I'm glad to move this item. Okay, great. So here is the motion on screen. And I so move. Okay. Yeah. I'll second. Okay, one moment. Right. And I'll go ahead and take roll call vote. Uh, Deskin? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Falcon? Yes. Cruz? Lee? Yes. Vanarelli? Yes. Great. Motion passes. Okay. Thanks, Crystal. Let's let's move on to the update update items for B and C. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, the, I'm just going to provide a few updates regarding the 2021 and 2022 partnership grants, uh, primarily for 2021, uh, because the, the grant uh, administration is, is not officially done. There's just a few updates. Uh, so the evaluation reports for the 2021 partnership grants uh, will be released on January 28th and, and due March, uh, mid-March. The reporting period, uh, again, is that January 1 to December 31st, which is the grant year. Um, as a reminder for the 2021 grants, uh, grantees with the approved carryovers will have until June 30th of this year to spend down those funds. And then we'll be tracking on the staff end uh, just to ensure that unspent funds are returned back to the State Board and added to the Partnership Grant Reserve. Uh, going right along to uh, agenda item 4C, updates to the 2022 Partnership Grants. Um, a couple of updates for here as well, just because that's the, the most recent uh, grant, but we, we've just finished, concluded the application review and um, allocation process. The uh, Judicial Council approved a total allocation of uh, 2.58 million for 36 eligible projects. Um, just administrative wise, the, the partnership grant agreements were released in December uh, due this month. And then 
um, award dis disbursement uh, is scheduled for February. Um, just to note for the 2022 partnership grants, uh, the grantees must submit a mid-year partnership grant evaluation, uh, which is going to be due in July uh, with a reporting period of January 1 to June 30th. I shared a brief update at our last meeting. Um, this is just in line with the reporting requirements um, with, uh, due to the, the State Budget Act. All right. Um, just, just to, so everybody maybe is kept straight on, on all these different grant streams because there's so many of them that are in the air at any one given time. What what Crystal was just talking about were the grants for 2022 that this committee or its predecessor group approved last summer. So what we're now going to move on to be talking about are what we're calling Partnership Grant 2.0, which is some additional money for 2022 grants that the legislature approved um, at the end of the last session which we talked about before. But I just wanted to kind of remind everybody of what we're, what we're talking about here. So any questions about that? So why don't, why don't we move on then to Partnership Grant 2.0, which is really the heart of this meeting. <clears throat> Sure, so I just wanted to um, give a reminder and an overview of, of this funding. Uh, as Eric mentioned, we do have several funding streams, so we're just trying to um, keep them all, all going, but also knowing the differences for this. So as a reminder for PG 2.0, we have about 3.88 available for funding for this funding, uh, funding opportunity. Um, all applicants are subject to the same threshold partnership grant eligibility requirements. And uh, for continuity, we are utilizing the same rubric that we used for the 2022 partnership grants. Um, applicants were given the option of um, one or uh, both uh, options below. Option one is for our 2022 grantees who wish to seek supplemental funding for an existing 2022 grant. Um, that option has a shorter uh, grant period of nine months, uh, beginning in April and ending of December of this year. And then grantees may only request up to their original requested amount with the supplemental funding. Um, as a reminder, the committee met on November and agreed um, that this would be a uh, these applications would be reviewed and led by um, the, the staff team in consultation with a committee member, and that was Christina Avanarelli. And then option two is the new application option. Uh, this has a 21 month grant period, April through December of next year. Uh, and for uh, this grant, we recommended a minimum funding request of 75 and maximum of 300,000. The deadline was December 17, and here's just a breakdown of the uh, applications that we received and the funding of what that looks like. Uh, at, at, as of the deadline, we received 28 uh, PG 2.0 applications, uh, 11 of which were supplemental uh, and 17 new applications in terms of monetary amounts compared to uh, the total amount available. You can see the breakdown below. So and for option one, we received a total of 206,000 total requested, um, and then 4.5 million for the new, uh, new applications. Just pausing here to, to uh, if there's any questions that the committee has. Um. So we have to cut a million dollars? Is that? Mm hmm Okay, We're almost. All right, thank you. Um, right, so I'll, I'll just provide a quick update about option one, uh, which, which staff has reviewed. Uh, so that, that uh, we, again, we received 11 applications totaling 206,000. Um, I don't know if, if the committee recalls, but when we talked about this option, we did the quick math and um, had, if all the grantees who were, um, had applied for supplemental funding, that would have been 500 or so thousand. So now we have a, a, a a more uh, an actual number of what this total is for the supplemental piece. Um, the range of the supplemental amounts ranged from four thousand to four hundred thousand, and uh, staff is in the process of reviewing that. Uh, the four, four, forty thousand. You said forty thousand. Yeah. 
yeah, four to 40. Um, so staff is currently to uh, reviewing to ensure that grantees have addressed any application deficiencies and, and specify how the supplemental uh, funds will be spent. Uh, we're utilizing the feedback from the scoring rubrics, so think the prior uh, submitted applications. But again, these were approved 2022 projects uh, by the committee and commission uh, and judicial council. So it's, it's really just making sure that there's justification for this request. Um, we'll present the funding recommendations at the February 16 committee meeting. Crystal? Are you so you oh. said you received eleven applications for two hundred and six thousand? Is the committee, is the subgroup recommending that we allocate that in the entirety of that two hundred and six that we basically award the grants that were requested? Yeah. So based on um, our the the staff team's initial review, we don't have any substantive concerns and and do anticipate uh, proposing the full amount. We are still following up with a few administrative questions with the grantees, um, but are leaning towards. Uh, the, that full uh, rec full recommendation. Chris, sorry, Christine, I think you had uh, mentioned. Did, did you get a sense of why um, we only had 11 applications totaling 200? I mean, why didn't everybody just try to get the rest of their funding? Did, did, did we get not get the message out well enough or? Um, well, we had we had we had a webinar. We had a, a lot a lot of the grantees that I spoke to. I think some of them opted for option two um, and thought that their energies would, would would be spent in submitting a new application than trying to get the remaining of their of their grant award. I, I, I would both. just I would also well I, I think Christina that that it was just a, a matter of where they wanted to put their time and energy. Um, hmm. But I, I would also just add um, that the outreach for uh, this supplemental, both the supplemental and the new uh, application opportunity, um, I think was very successful because we had 17 new applications. Um, and for those of you, I think Christina, you know, being on the partnership grant committee for so many years, we often don't see new projects. Um, and so to see 17, um, I, at least for me, I thought uh, was a, a really huge success. So um, I, I think, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of funding opportunities right now for um, our grantees uh, with additional and a lot of additional funds so that it, they just mm -hmm. may have decided that, you know, they wanted to put their resources and time elsewhere. Um, and then just a reminder for those who are seeking supplemental funding, for every grantee who is interested um, in applying, they were provided the full scoring rubric breakdown. Um, and then staff also had one-on-one -on -one calls with them to talk them through um, where there were application concerns. So we're hoping this um, effort will garner stronger applications for the 2023 cycle. So hopefully it's, it's uh, beneficial in, in multiple ways. Um, so for option two, we have our initial calibration today, but before that, Eric, I just wanted to remind the committee of our, our, our timeline um, with the sort of three grants going on. Um, I, I've um, made some updates just to reflect the meeting dates here, but just to call out um, our PG 2.0, we're, we're in the thick of it. Um, this is a very compressed timeline um, just to make that April 1 uh, grant start date. So we'll, we'll be doing the initial calibration today, February 16, we'll be finalizing the funding recommendations to be approved by the Trust Fund Commission in February and Judicial Council in March. Um, 2023 is not too far behind um, because we are releasing that RFP and application on January 28th um, and staff is working to, to make sure it's updated and has those changes that we've discussed both on the RFP and then um, I think specifically uh, making sure that we reference prior evaluations or have that available. So um, staff is working on that just to be uh, responsive and, and as comprehensive for the committee once those applications are submitted. Um, and that will be due in March. Can, can I be sure that everyone has on their calendar February 16th is our next committee meeting because that's the meeting where um, we're going to be approving the, the final uh, proposed distributions for recommendation to the full commission. Um, and I'm not sure we got the official notice of this meeting out yet. So just be sure February 16th from one to four is on your calendar. And if you don't have a formal meeting notice, you'll get one. I think it was sent, Eric. I've got it in my calendar. Oh, you do? All right. If I've got it. I think we can <laughs> send You've got it. Good. Yeah. Don't be so sure, but okay. Great. Okay, great. Um, so 
I'll end this screen here and we'll, we'll jump into initial calibration. Um, I do have a, a spreadsheet. Thank you all for submitting your, your scores and we, we could take a closer look at that. Um, one moment, I have a lot of windows open. So while, while um, Crystal is searching for that spreadsheet, she's now got it. Let's sort of set some expectations here. First of all, thank you everybody for taking time out of your busy schedules to look at these proposals and, and do your best to calibrate them. So what we're, what we're, the purpose of today's meeting is to get some, hopefully get some consensus on how these proposals should be ranked on the various dimensions. You know, it would be nice if we could reach total consensus on each dimension for each project and we'll shoot for that. If we don't get there um, and there's a difference, uh, we may end up averaging, but the point is to have a robust discussion and let's just get everybody's views on the table and let's just see if we can drive this to consensus or as close to consensus as we can get. Is that fair, Crystal? Yeah, so just, just a reminder, um, what we're looking for as well, or just to reiterate, is, is really taking a look at the exceeds, meets, and below expectations and um, discussing and getting guidance from the committee as to um, things to look out for for each of these um, certain thresholds and, and scoring rubric categories and, and calibrating on, on that page. Um, we Since we only looked at three applications, I think it's also possible to get to a final calibrated score just to get these three um, ready and, and scored. Uh, before the uh, scoring team comprised of staff um, and Eric looks at the remaining applications. Um, <clears throat> all right. Uh, so can I walk through the spreadsheet a little bit? Yeah, uh, with, please, with sure. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. oh, Crystal, so, would you mind just shrinking the window a little bit so you have a little, it's a little easier to see? Shrink, shrinking uh, it I or so bigger? Make it bigger, yeah. Okay, okay. However, however sorry, I, I saw the window and all the extra, I guess it was thinking on my screen. Thank you. Okay, great. So what you see here are for each of the applications from ICLS, um, MHAS, and Public Council, the, the orange here is the uh, staff calibrated score. Um, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but our, our, we have about, we have four four staff members who will be looking and we met uh, prior earlier this week and, and had a calibrated Sort of staff calibrated score and, and discussion amongst ourselves and um, that that score is here uh, below are the individual committee member scores um, and then a couple of, of math um, math things we got the average score across all of the available scorings um, number of scores and then the standard uh, deviation um, just for reference to see um, if there were large variances between um, uh, among the the grading so just to call out the overall total center deviation for ICLS was 13. Um, MHAS, Mental Health Advocacy Services was 11.7. And then Public Council, where I think there was most consensus uh, was, was at a six. <clears throat> uh, I also did want to highlight that um, I believe these applications do represent the types of applications we have as a whole. So we have um, applications that serve uh, rural rural counties, such as ICLS. We have uh, newer applications of, of their type, um, possibly in different courthouses, um, as, as exemplified by mental health advocacy services. And then we do have several other expansion proposals for existing grantees. So I think the discussion we have uh, may be may take that into consideration and uh, maybe we can discuss some scenarios if it is one of these three types to further help um, the uh, scoring team when we look at the remaining proposals. All right, so Eric, I don't know if you wanted, if you wanted to get started with ICLS, which had the, the largest uh, standard deviation and, and variance between um, among, among the scores. Yeah, it looks like that. So we're moving, if we, if we do it in this order, um, we're moving from most controversial to least controversial. <laughs> so, um, well, I mean, you know, I don't have a strong view. So why don't we start with the ICLS? Hey, can I just ask a, a background question? And I apologize, there was an email issue and I didn't, uh, I didn't have a chance to do the scoring, but I did review these. So these are three proposals out of how many? 17, uh, seven, 17 new, new proposals. Okay, and we're, but we're only discussing these three today? Yeah. Yeah, Joe. The remember the the the, uh, 
the uh, procedure we we decided upon in our last meeting, I think, is that we would have a group calibration of three. We would kind of get the sense of the group for how these things should go. And then staff plus me would take that input and apply it to the remaining uh, 14, I guess it 13, 14, 17 minus three is 14, right? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then we'll come back to the committee with a, with a recommendation on February 16th. I right? remember that now. Okay, I forgot, so thank you. Great, so I guess we can go through each of the selection criteria and talk about variances. I will say um, for, for admin and project budget and continuity planning, um, it, it, more, it mostly seems that we're, we're in alignment. So uh, I'm interested to have a, a little bit more discussion about court involvement and project impact for this project. So um, court involvement, um, we had four scores out of 15 out of meets expectations, and then the staff calibrated score, and, and Will, we're at a 24 exceeds. So um, I don't know if everyone has their notes for this particular project, but... Um, so yes, let, let, let's, let's remind ourselves of what this, what this is. Um, so uh, this was a, a family law clinic in Riverside, right, to take place at, at a law school, which is a little bit about 0.7 miles from the courthouse or something like that. And by the way, Dan, uh, I know I've talked with you about this issue a lot. Does the 0.7 miles from the courthouse, is that a non-starter here or is that a problem? Because they're supposed to be at the courthouse for these projects, right? So so for that that's that requirement, I think we talked about that um, last year, that at or near a courthouse, that's actually not a requirement. It's, I think it's something that um, that may have gotten carry, carried over. What we're really looking for is the, the court involvement and the court integration. Okay, all right. So. And, and I would also add that um, given uh, all that uh, legal aid and the self-help centers and the courts have learned through the pandemic that uh, remote work um, has often in many cases be, had, to be, had to be the necessity. Um, and, and so, um, you know, I think this committee should take that into account as well. Okay. The, 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 uh, the application says um, at or near except on unusual circumstances and we're in those. So, All right. um, okay. you know, we, we really, we're looking for engagement uh, in addition to physical presence, you know, and okay. physical presence is secondary, that, but engagement is good, that, that's still important. Okay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say it, it, in the past, um, even when it was, the, it, we've really also had to look at the community I mean, we have some courthouses, you know, where it's like, well, maybe there's a broom closet, you know, that's that's not used a couple of days a week. So it it has really gets that that court engagement and if the you know if people think this is easy for people to get to and all that. So, well, does anybody? I mean, I guess I'll just jump in with my own thought. I mean, it, to me, it was a meets. I didn't really see anything terribly extraordinary from my perspective. I mean, there, there were planned meetings with the court, which is quite ordinary. Um, they talked about enhanced access to court records and mentioned that a few times in the proposal. Um, I mean, that didn't seem like that big a deal to me. And I wasn't even sure what they were gonna do with that anyway. I mean, they said they were gonna look and audit the number of filings yeah. that the clinic made, but you know, so what? I, that, they weren't going to evaluate anything or do much with it. So I don't know. I just seemed like a nothing terribly extraordinary about that from my perspective, which is why I rated it as a meets. But maybe if somebody thinks somebody thinks it's an exceeds, maybe somebody could explain why. <laughs> since, since I think I was the only uh, committee member to uh, think that, I I can chime in. Um, I did have concerns about it not being at the courthouse. And I think, I understand it's not a, a regulation, but in my internal scoring, I um, I think accessibility is important, especially when you're in what looks like an urban environment. And I was concerned if, this is, uh, this is a little meta, how should we evaluate accessibility? I think there is a gain in accessibility when it's at the courthouse, because if you have to file papers or do anything there, that's helpful. Um, and then as you get further away, I think there just needs to be some measure of, hey, is it easy to get to? Can you park there? Is it close to public transportation? 
for the people who need these services, transportation is really difficult. And my personal experience when seeking assistance is phone calls are so hit or miss that usually I just have to go to the place and say, can you help me? Um, so uh, if we could add that to our scoring, whenever something is not at the courthouse, I would really appreciate that. I want to say it now because otherwise I'll we'll forget. So I apologize for digressing. But I think it's really important that we at least look at accessibility for uh, potential clients. Or well, that sounds like, or so Will, that sounds like a negative to me. Why did you give it an exceeds? Well, so <laughs> the positive was I was impressed by the uh, electronic record access. My understanding is that's not normal and that a lot of the courts don't share access to programs. Um, and the partnership here, so I, I know the category is court involvement, but they talk about um, in the category and description, significant cooperation between the partner court and legal services organizations and integration with other court-based services, all of that stuff. So the school, working with the school and um, the court and then being the organization that brings those two together, I think is excellent. And to expose uh, law students to the opportunities very easily to help volunteer in this way and to have, you kind of get uh, teacher supervision for free um, in a way where they, they can go to their teacher and say, hey, I, I encountered this situation, what are your thoughts? So I thought that if, if I expand it from just the court to also include legal, other legal services organizations, I think the, the collaboration there was enough for me to push it over the edge and also the access to the court records. What about staff? <clears throat> yeah, I, I put our, our consolidated notes below. <clears throat> so the planned monthly meetings, um, just a reminder, the requirement is that they, uh, they meet quarterly. So that was more frequent than the requirement. Um, and then also the access to the court records was a, another reason why we um, had this particular project as, as an exceeds. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to hear back uh, from other folks who had scored it as a meet for um, their thoughts behind it. But I think Jason has his hands raised. Hand raised. Yeah, I mean, my understanding was if they're, I mean, they're planning on forming uh, attorney-client relationships that they'd have enhanced access to court records anyhow. So I don't know that it's necessarily unique to the program so much as the ability to have an attorney-client relationship where they're representing the client um, in that limited capacity. So I, I don't know that, what I didn't see was something in addition to what any other attorney would have access to as far as records are relative to the court records. Um, I mean, I, I was satisfied with, with what their court involvement was um, and the relative proximity. Um, though I think it's a valid point to consider. Um, so I kind of saw that as, you know, meets expectations. There are a few other things that didn't really have categories. And I think that may have caused me to weigh down court involvement and project impact, you know, not the least of which was a statement that they would represent both sides, but they're also going to be checking for conflicts. And there's only, I think, one attorney and one paralegal. So I'm not really sure how they could possibly do that. Um, even if they got, like, unless they got waivers for all those people. Um, so I'm not sure how that, and they didn't explain how they were going to, to manage that. So it seemed, I don't know if that is fully baked or those people would end up getting referred out uh, you know, to another uh, AA organization. Can, um, can you clarify whether there's uh, representation, Crystal? Um. I didn't think there was. I didn't think I there was. It was just doc prep. Yeah, exactly. So if I could weigh in with a couple of thoughts. Did, did anyone else have concerns about the partnership with the California Desert Trial Academy College of Law? I, I had never heard of that, so I've, I've Googled it. And it seems that it's an unaccredited law school that used to be I mean, this almost reads, <laughs> I'm on law dragon. It always reads like kind of a, like a, not Stephen King. Who's the, who, who's the guy who writes the, the crazy legal novels? Anyway, um, 
like they used to have their classes in a casino, apparently, the Fantasy Springs Resort Casino. And so, um, so, so Joe, just uh, we also work with admissions, who's our um, who oversees the the law school. So unaccredited is actually type of a type a law school type. So you have the ABA accredited, the um, Cal accredited, which is um, the Committee of Bar Examiners, and then the unaccredited. Uh, they do have guidelines um, that they follow and that the state bar um, oversees. So in terms of them being a legitimate school, um, I, I don't think that that raised just because I. For us as staff, we we're aware and familiar with with this law school. So um, you, you <laughs> are you are familiar with it? Yes, yes. It's, 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 yeah, the state bar, it, like Crystal and Elizabeth, are not personally familiar, but the state bar is familiar with this law school. They are uh, a law school that uh, the state bar oversees. Right. And do we have any information about? I mean. Uh, other than knowing that we're we, we've heard of it, <laughs> I mean, is there any kind of like it, the, the, review the, or this assessment? This law school is or? overseen by the State Bar of California as an unregistered law school, um, so I, I don't think we have any. I don't. I don't think it's you know our. our it, we're not in the position to make any additional commentary on you know on, on the 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 you know efficacy or or soundness of the 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 program, but. Um, they, they are a legitimate law school in, in California. And for a lot of um, rural areas, um, California accredited and registered law, registered and unregistered law schools are the only law schools available. Um, and so uh, I think that that's the area we're talking about here. Well, okay, you, you, let's assume, uh, me assuming that they're, they meet some, some level of uh, some standard that we would find acceptable. I mean, I don't, I don't find cooperation with a law school to be all that extraordinary either, really. I mean, there are a lot of clinics that, that leverage law schools. I mean, USC, where I teach, is involved in, in numerous clinics. That, that's not a terribly innovative idea. I mean, it's nice. It's good. It's nice. I think it's fine. I think it's good. But, you know, I don't, again, I, that doesn't, in my mind, merit and exceeds expectations just because they're partnering with a law school. Um, all right, uh, I think Jason and then Will had your, you have your hand raised. Yeah, so I, I don't know, I wanna go back to the attorney-client relationship piece, but on page 17, I mean, it asked the question, will this project establish an attorney-client relationship? And the answer provided is yes. Mm. So I, I'm not sure if others are looking at a different document, but that's where I caught it. Yeah. Yeah, Will? Um, so I admit, <laughs> because I'm not an attorney and, and don't work in this area, um, maybe the court access and the law school collaboration and providing space, they're also providing space yeah. for the, the, the place isn't uh, extraordinary. But I, I guess I will ask explicitly, um, is this access normal for um, these folks for partnership grants? For the court records, I should say. Um, can I speak to that a little bit? Um, because I think, um, Jason, the difference may be um, that they may be establishing an attorney-client relationship, but not appearing as attorney of record. And so, um, in fact, usually these clinics do not. So I'm not sure that they is your understanding in that situation that they would still have access to the court database? So will in general, our rules of court say that family law matters are of course public, but they're not um, available on electronic court system. Um, as a little yeah, bit I mean, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, if they have an established attorney client relationship and they're able to show it, and, you know, documented evidence of an agreement on such. I mean, even if they're not the right. attorney record, like they, they, the court may still acknowledge that, which you know would provide them access, even if they're not, you know, one appearing on litigation. Um, and maybe that's the the nature of what they're working out with the court. Right. But I'm not sure that that in and of itself is overly unique. Um, you know, as to other arrangements where there's an attorney-client relationship, but they're not the attorney of record. You know, but what? Yeah, and I mean, again, what were they going to do with this access? Yeah. Let's assume it is unique, um, or maybe a little bit special. I mean, I, 
I, I didn't really see that they were going to do anything yeah. all that dramatic with this access. What I saw was they were going to check the number of filings that were made by those folks that they were assisting, which yeah. I presume to mean they want to get context beyond the filings and documents that they're assisting them on and see all the other things that that uh, client does, you know, arising out of the assistance. Right. And so that provides an additional data point to show that, yeah, we helped them on this document because we helped them on this document. They then were able to subsequently, you know, proceed with the, the, uh, the case and file like four more documents, you know, arrive, you know moving the, the proceeding forward. And I think the other thing, Eric, in our experience is people <clears throat> who come into self-help often don't know where they're at with their case. Um, you know, there are a lot of papers and family law in different stages of the case. And so by being able like, oh, has somebody been defaulted? Uh, you know, what, what sort of is happening? And it's very hard to um, sort of sort out what, what documents people need, um, and particularly if it's offsite. So um, we have in the past had, a, you know, a program that was at the courthouse but didn't have electronic access. And so they had to send the litigant down to get their file um, and, you know, pay for documents in the file or, you know, with fee waiver, get them for free, but, you know, to be able to sort out what was the next stage. So um, I think electronic access is, you know, is extremely helpful, but um, it, it, it would be available if somebody, I mean, presumably it would be available if somebody had an attorney client relationship. I think the key is, how that, that yeah. gets worked out. I, I think the other thing that just occurred to me while you were talking about in, in the rules, I know the individual is going to have access to their own files electronically, right? And so if they form an attorney-client uh, relationship with ICLS, ICLS on their behalf as their counsel can then go access their files, right? Presumably. Because it's, yeah, I think it's we the have individual granting the approval, not, not the court. Right. Presumably, if if somebody has a computer and they have the litigant with them, they can get whatever information is needed. But well, so Bonnie, are you saying that like if you just look at the public counsel, the guardianship clinic, that, that they do not have electronic access in LA to to the files? They could not do a similar thing that these guys are proposing to do. Um, LA has worked out relationships with different legal services providers, and I don't know if if guardianships are under the same, I can't remember if probate is under the same rules as family law. With many files, for example, with civil files, they're, you know, the documents are open and available. But um, if you've got, the other thing is, you know, payment provisions, right? So if they've worked out a system where, um, and I, again, don't know the, how the court manages their, their records, but in some courts you have to pay to get it access to look at different documents. Is that what they're saying, that they're actually going to have access to, to scanned documents? Because that's very different than just access to the docket. And that's pretty cool if they did, but I didn't, I didn't get that. Yeah, um, Danielle? Yeah. Yeah, so I pulled up the application um, and it says the court will assist in evaluating the project by providing electronic access to its case registry and case documents to ICLS. That's at the top of page six. That's helpful. So they'll essentially have access to the court file? I'm still, I'm also that's, scanning that's to check. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, that's but what it sounds like which, um, you know, uh, prior to joining State Bar, I worked at a legal aid organization that had partnership grants, uh, which is a big deal. Um, yeah. Especially if they're uh, available electronically. I know uh, I've worked in, in a guardianship clinic where we had, you know, to, you know, look through a, a file that was like five rooms of paper to define yeah. the documents that we're looking no, I agree. for. So, that is um, a big deal. so I think, you know, that that's that's where we think, even though, you know, there may be other avenues for the litigant to maybe access these files, but for the for ICLS to have easier access to it, I think it is a big deal. Um, and, and I think that's that's where the staff score is coming from. Okay. There's two additional factors that might also merit consideration. One is that um, 
for those programs that do get access to court records on an enhanced basis, typically it's just used for managing the litigation. It's not used for evaluation purposes. And there is a discussion here about maybe trying to bring that piece in instead of just knowing where things are, knowing where they went, how they went afterwards uh, is valuable. Uh, and it, you know, it means that the information extends beyond the, the, the litigation itself and, and goes past perhaps um, where it, the, the, the minimum. The other interesting piece is that this is in Coachella uh, and it's a relationship with the courthouse that really is novel. Uh, the court appears to be making some changes on its own, being innovative in its own processes. And uh, we wanted to recognize that the innovation isn't necessarily only on one side here. What, what, what's the innovation? Uh, is it well, the electronic well, access? Yeah, the, the court is, is opening its doors apparently in a way that it hasn't previously. And in a, in a rural community, um, sometimes it's been difficult to move um, institutional practices. Uh, they lag behind what cities do. So this is a, a step forward for Coachella. Jason? Uh, I just wanted to give some follow-up uh, or to your question about guardianship versus family and uh, the and access. So it's uh, California Rural Court 2.503C. Um, you can get uh, access to electronic access to the extent um, the courts have electronic uh, files, but it has to be in the courthouse that you get the access. Uh, family code is similar, similarly limited. So uh, that's for public access. So for uh, ICLS to have access remotely or uh, public counsel's office. You know, I think there is a distinction about the attorney-client uh, relationship that provides that avenue uh, where public counsel uh, through the guardianship clinic probably would not have that um, if it's tr traditional clinic and from my understanding of the, the arrangement. So they would have to either access publicly available documents from within the courthouse or have those they are assisting come prepare the documents. Okay, well, I guess I guess you've persuaded me that at least on court involvement, maybe it does merit and exceed. So you can you can bump my rating up to a twenty on that one. How do other folks feel who um, initially rank this project as it meets? Um, if we see something similar for the the scoring team, we'll take a closer look to to um, assess the distinction and figure out where that is. But if it's as close to as ICLS is with in this instance would that merit a, a, a beyond expectation or exceeds expectation just wanted to confirm for some guidance if you're doing this is joe if you're doing this in real time you can put me down for meets yes. oh great anybody else uh, uh, any thoughts on this because we i want to just be mindful of time here anybody i else? would I would be willing to change it to an exceeds if it's not based upon the attorney client privilege because I've got other concerns that are bound to that piece from this uh, score. I don't know if that helps, but I'm kind of stuck between the two. The differential between 15 and 20 makes it seem like a much bigger leap than it really is. And, and I think, uh, Jason, the attorney client privilege issue might be under a different topic, project impact possibly. Okay, well, I would be fine with 20 on court involvement, keeping the 15 and project impact. Um, Crystal, Crystal, can you change Jason's to, yeah. Okay, any other thoughts on court involvement? Anybody else wanna change their views or if not, we can, let's move on. You know, if I, if I could say a word on project impact, what was persuading me, I think I actually rated them, yeah, below expectations because, um, the 300 services in their chart just seemed really low to me. Really low. But particularly in a county where this is the only game in town for family law, for indigent services, and given the huge number of filings that they reported and the huge number of percentage of those filings that are pro bono, to be, you know, kind of planning to do 300 services, it just seemed really pretty low to me. So I, was uh, I had the same concern. 
um, Eric uh, and I, the thing that, that so I rated them um, six seats and it was, it was totally based on the, the rural character. And so 300 seems small, but the, based on the services that they're going to provide and the uh, demographic that county, um, I felt like it had a great potential. And so I definitely gave them, graded on a curve based on that, the rural nature. So I, I'm not as committed to my hot egg seeds here because of the, what you just said. But I, I'd be really interested in other views. Yeah, Jason. Um, I, don't, I don't know how rural Indio is. Uh, I think the population in the city is some 90,000. And by comparison, Nevada County is about 100,000 and we probably assist in our self-help center family law facilitators office more than 300 in similar and you know document prep um, through the, the family law facilitators office on a yearly basis. So I would hope that a dedicated office like this would would exceed that. Um, granted, they're serving more than just the you know city limits of India. Um, that said, I mean I you know I know some sometimes the projects are expensive for their effective reach, um, and that could be it. And I know it's kind of out in the the edge of populated California as you start getting out on that side of Riverside. Uh, well, uh, just a question. The 300 for document prep also didn't make sense to me based on the fact that they would be establishing relationships and the other services. Is this some kind of like jargon that I don't understand? Like document prep means we'll be providing individual services and recommendations or Can, can anyone clarify? I'm, I'm sorry, well, can you repeat your question? Sure, so they list only 300 on their number of people they expect to serve for document preparation. And but the services that they seem to be providing, especially if they're going to be establishing an attorney-client relationship, I, I don't understand why that's just document prep. Wouldn't it include other things? I mean, when you est establish an attorney-client relationship, yes, that it could, 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 may include other things, but in this situation, it sounds like they're established in that relationship, but they will still only do document prep. Okay, thanks for the clarification. I just, it didn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, my, my, my sense of it was that um, they're not gonna go in and do representation. What they're gonna do is help the litigants with the preparation of their documents and to get them ready. But um, that uh, in that process, they will dive deep and um, learn enough to establish that attorney-client relationship and provide um, a, a, a higher level of service than might be available through an FLF model or a, a self-help model uh, where all you're really doing is, is providing legal information instead of making recommendations. They're probably that, that actually doing the documents. They're probably doing the documents. Yeah. You know, that, asking that questions, probing questions, maybe giving advice and doing the documents and say, here, go to court. Here's what you do. Yeah. yeah so that's, that was also my understanding as well that in their mind, document prep was guidance on what they should be putting in the document based yeah. on their situation, as distinguished from what you would have, even when you have. Uh, FLF offices that, that can do document prep. It's, you know, here's what the field is asking for. You tell me what to put in this field. And then they put it in. Like, there's no advice on what they should put there uh, from a strategy standpoint. All right, Elizabeth? I'm just uh, uh, addressing the issue raised about the 300 services provided. Um, there, uh, only requesting funding for um, about point, a little over 0.5 an attorney and 0.5 for a paralegal. And so I think that's really yeah. what's driving the, the 300 uh, number. Uh, not that it's not that there's not the need, there's definitely the need. It's just that they only have about one staff person who will, you know, a total FTE, one FTE that would be providing services. Still seems very low to me. Sorry. 
like very low. I mean, come on, they're, they're not they're not providing full. I mean, they're helping prepare some documents. They're probably in most cases, in many cases, pro forma documents. I don't know. I, I would disagree, Eric. That um, you know, they do need to interview the litigants. They need to gather information. They need, may need to untangle things that have been that have happened before. Um, I I think that you know, three hundred. I think they may just be trying to be realistic. If they're drafting declarations, that mm -hmm. can be some, some work. Yeah, exactly. There, there, it, it's not just checking off boxes. It, it really is, you know, applying, you know, the rules and, and requirements uh, to, 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 to the situation. Um, I also want to point out another consideration is that this is a, a new project that we'll be launching. So if you contrast it to public council who is seeking an expansion, um, this, this project will need some time to, to launch off. And um, so I, I don't believe they're, they're anticipating to begin services until Q2, um, which, which may be a, a factor versus a, an expansion where they have a sense of uh, who will be coming in and a larger number, especially in a, most, a more densely uh, dense city or county. So. Oh, and I see Jason wrote something in the chat. Jason, do you want to say that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, I mean, I guess it depends on the scope of document prep, right? I mean, if if they're preparing pleadings and motions documents, I mean, that can be pretty complex and a service you just cannot get in a family law facilitator's office. I mean, filling out forms, income and expense declarations and, guide, and kind of how that works, that's one thing, and I might say if that's what they were the scope of what they were doing, 300 is probably low. But if there's motions and pleadings going on and it's starting to get complicated, then you know, that that would be maybe. Uh, well, do, do we do we do we know do we know? And and remember, I, they they are leveraging yeah. law school volunteers too. It's not like the one attorney is going to do all this stuff, drafting all the declarations and the motions. If that if they're actually doing that. That is a fair question, and I didn't see clarification one way or the other uh, when I read the, the application. So that's kind of where I'm at a loss in trying to, to so squeeze we, out. Mm -hmm. We can go back and clarify. Um, so well, this, yeah, go ahead. I don't know who was speaking. Oh. I also think. Um, while using student law student volunteers is great and has many advantages, it um, there's also a fair amount of time, right, in reviewing and um, overseeing that work. You know, this attorney, the staff attorney, is actually, if I understand the proposal correctly, it's not even going to be at the law school. It's going to be um, right advice. Thoughts on project impact. Eric, can I ask one question? Yeah. What would be, if, if 300 is too low a number for project impact, what do you think would be an appropriate number for services provided there to meet your expectations? Oh, I don't know. I mean, you know, the other projects were significantly more. I mean, like the mental health project was looking at 700. I mean, that to me mm -hmm. seems more reasonable something like in that range. Remember, this is 21 months. This is 21 months, 300 services. It's like $900 per service. I don't know, it just seems really, really low to me. It is also possible that they'll exceed the, per, the, the scope, but I think it's, it's also a double-edged sword. If they give too high of a number and the evaluations come through and they're they're lower, like that may be, that may impact future like scorings because we'll look at that information. I don't know if this was a conservative number, just knowing that this is a new project and given the breadth of services they, they plan to provide in, in different um, areas under family law. Um, it's, I think it's it's a little hard to have a, a number um, that will ex uh, need meets, but I think you need to consider populate like the, the counties and rural versus urban and um, those as well. It, it, we didn't have an established minimum that we don't mention in the um, in the RFP. So uh, 
I guess I just want to know like how do how would we would gauge uh, an ex, uh, a meets versus a, a below because uh, for for a project that hasn't begun yet um, and may have lower deliverables in comparison, uh, we I don't know we haven't reviewed the rest of them and we may have maybe lower numbers for for the other new proposals. So I think the other ones I rated as either meets or exceeds the other two. So is there guidance for staff in, in the review of the rest of the applications on, uh, I mean, are we looking strictly at numbers um, to gauge project impact? What other factors should we be taking into account? Uh, I, I will say though, for, for, for the staff calibrated score and other considerations is just the, the descriptions because the impact category does this ask about the demonstrated need. And so um, ICLS was, was really, uh, I, we thought that they were great about illustrating um, the, the county that they're, they'll be serving the, the need by referencing the number of, of um, filings per year. So sort of establishing that potential project impact, especially for a new project was a, a consideration. Um, it may warrant a meets versus an exceeds, uh, but we, you know, we, we don't want to uh, <laughs> penalize a new project that is still um, trying to potentially um, get started. Yeah, I, I wish I had guidance for the staff, but my feeling is I have to go with the best possible outcome. And if I assume that they exceed their numbers and they accomplish their outreach and get those people in there, then looking prospectively, I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. That was my feeling. If other members don't feel that way, I, I guess the calibration part of this is we should say so. But I, I was willing, willing to give them a break on the numbers. But I, I think retrospectively, if they don't hit those numbers or they don't achieve, then it's a big question for me whether we've spent our money well and whether they should continue as a project. Um. Yeah, I mean, to answer, so Elizabeth, your, your question is what are what are the key factors? Yeah, I, I am heavily influenced by numbers, and, but also the, the kind of services that they propose to provide. And I do acknowledge that, that there does seem to be a huge need here. So I'm not disputing that for this service. Um, but I, again, I didn't see anything about kind of the way they're gonna deliver the service, the quality of the service that seemed, that, that would overcome you know, the, the relatively low number, here, low number here. You guys are all assuming they're gonna do all these great pleadings and motions and all this kind of stuff. I, I don't, didn't necessarily see that from the proposal. Maybe they are, but I, I didn't see that. So, so um, if we got clarity from, from ICLS about the, the depth of the services, uh, if it were, it is, you know, these, yeah, pleadings and motions and and or declarations rather um, that they're drafting for for the litigants would would that at least meet for you? Yeah, it might. It might. Yeah. So I mean, because I think you know we we the purpose of the calibration session today is for us to get for staff to get a sense of how to evaluate the balance of the applications. Um, so we don't necessarily need to settle on a score for this particular application today uh, because staff will need to go back and follow up and gather additional information. But uh, are, are there other additional factors we should be looking at just to in evaluating this um, category for, for other applications? And not just for Eric, for any of the yeah, community yeah. members. Yeah, no, understood. Does anybody else want to just add anything on the project impact or change their score or anything? Otherwise, we could we could move on. All right. Well, hearing none, so we don't seem to have all, as much controversy. We, I guess we have no controversy on the admin. We're all at all mm -hmm. at a six. Uh, six is that a meets? Yes. On admin. Yeah. So that, that feels pretty straightforward. I, I did have one question, request for clarification. Um, it looked like the only, on this one, on staffing, the only on-site personnel would be an experienced legal assistant supported by the school volunteers. And then they'd have a attorney available for, during video for video conferencing. Uh, is this uh, appropriate? Is this the way it's done? 
or are there any concerns here? Because I guess I'm concerned when you're dealing with potentially sensitive family issues handled by a volunteer or legal assistant, um, should I be concerned or is this an acceptable? Uh, uh, do I they think have acceptable it's, staffing? I think it's acceptable staffing. Um, Great. Okay, do you, do you need more explanation, Will? <laughs> Uh, I mean, feel free to give it, but I, I think that's all I wanted to be clarified on. So we can move on. Okay. I mean, a lot, a lot of um, uh, projects are supervised uh, in this way, not just partnership grant projects, but legal aid projects where, you know, if, especially now that Zoom and other uh, phone video conferencing uh, capabilities are available, um, it, it helps when the super, it, it allows the supervisor to be in multiple places at multiple times, just to be like on call when there's an issue. Typically, whoever's on site, whether it's a paralegal, legal document assistant, or a uh, you know, uh, other advocate, they're usually an expert in the field um, and and know when to elevate and ask questions. Um, so we, we think the supervision is, is adequate. Uh, Jason? I, I would tend to agree adequate, though it does beg the question of if they're kind of bouncing around and the primary point of contact is the legal assistant, you know, how much depth of guidance and advice are they giving? Um, in those interactions relative to project impact. So I think that kind of loops right back to the yeah. question. Sure, and we, I think that's a good question for us to get clarification on, Jason. Yeah, and, and are we also gonna get clarification on the, the kinds of services, you know, the declarations, motions, mm -hmm. and stuff like yes. that? Yes. Can we move on to budget? I wanna make one comment on budget. I, I gave it a meets and I think it, it is, um, you know, meets, but, it just for this project and, and the and at least public council, um, they, they seem to allocate what seemed to be a, a lot of money to admin. Um, they were alloc it was like it's a $236,000 grant or request, and they're proposing to allocate like 10% of that to admin, which seemed a little high to me. But what do, you, what do you guys think about that? Particularly staff, you guys are used to calibrating these things. Does that seem high or is that or is that right? I don't know, I, I won't respond for staff, but I did see it on the uh, public council one stuck out. Yeah, really yeah, I know they use their ICRP rate and I, I, I get why that's reasonable, but I also know that in other contexts, um, organizations, I know Judicial Council has for some grants capped that at 20%, uh, even if your ICRP exceeds 20%, you can only claim it for that. Indirect cost rate proposal. Uh, basically, it's a way of calculating your overhead. And indirect cost is actually one of the issues that's about to come before the rules committee in the context of law schools, but um, it has broader implications. And um, it is one that um, we're working on getting a coherent uh, policy across the board on. So, this is a hard one right now. Uh, I would I say that. 10% is probably not so bad, uh, you know, if you're using right. that instead of an ICRP. I mean, yeah, it's a lot because we want the grants to go to, you know, effective, productive work, but there's always going to be overhead that they have to account for. All right. I'm okay with that. Uh, Eric, you're a little bit hard to hear right now. Okay. I mean, I, that, that's fine. I'll accept that. 10% seems okay. <laughs> to continue that thread, because I was the only one who was disappointed with it. It was exactly along those lines of that uh, line 21 and 22, the administration and the budget where, and I will appreciate an education here. It seems like they're using what was called the allocated cost ratio and taking up the organization's expenses and applying them to the grant. But in other grants, I recall seeing they only use direct expenses for the program. Is that correct? Other partnership grants. I don't know if staff can answer that. As a general rule, um, we're used to seeing programs allocating the direct program expenses as line items, but increasingly programs are recognizing the sort of institutional cost of managing the project and putting that in as an admin line. Sometimes as an 
obligation to other funders like LSC or like so along those lines, but sometimes just on recommendation of other financial advisors. Uh, I, I believe so, admin personnel is also in relation to those in the um, executive team. These are new projects. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, the, ramp, the ramp up and coordination, um, I, I would uh, maybe expect to see larger amounts in those uh, budgeted items, maybe compared to our, our typical partnership grants, uh, which are I don't think have been new for a while. So um, that might be a reasoning um, be given the um, nature of the project and, and grant, long grant period, um, 21 months. So. Would it be a, correct to say that it, organizations that are able to do budgeting in this way, uh, ratioing it out, get an advantage because they can ask for the organizational expenses in addition to the direct grant expenses? So we don't prescribe in terms of like how to how a how the, the grantees um, budget out. I don't know if that's an advantage um, or not. Uh, I think what we clear what we look for in terms of this requirement is just uh, ensuring that it's it's clear on how um, the the requested grant amount will be used towards the grant, whether that be administration um, or 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 the um, providing of services. Um, Majority have been in personnel costs, but we are seeing increases in the technology line items, for example, um, with with remote work too. So it's 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 it varies. Okay, because it seems to me that if you you ask for more and we give everybody a haircut, you're going to get more of what you want. And here they ask for money for space, even though it's being donated by the law school, but. It's because they're asking for the office space for the staff back in their office. And that seems like a great advantage and a great way to do it if you want to ask for more money. But it, it looks like it disadvantages organizations that only ask for direct costs for the grant. And if we're going to say they can do it this way, it feels like it should be really clear in the application that there's a way better way if you want to receive the full benefit, especially for small nonprofits who might not get the importance of doing it this way. So it sounds like we should follow up with them to just clarify what all the indirect costs are um, and that they're directly related to this grant. That would be great. And if we had that information, well, just hypothetically, and uh, that it was all for the grant, would you bump up your score to a six? Yes. OK. Uh, Okay, so I, I'm, just, I'm just asking just for like guidance purposes, like what 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 people are looking, what the committee members are looking for in terms of um, how to how to uh, score these. That makes perfect sense, Liz. Okay, thank you. What about continuity planning? I think most of us thought it was sort of a meets. Will you thought it was an exceeds? I'm sorry for being the outlier here. Um, oh, what's your basis for it? Uh, and let me look at my notes really quick. Sorry, one second. So while we're looking, Christina, so you're not persuaded on court involvement to bump it up to a 20 even with the electronic access? I don't know. I'm just, my whole issue with this application, I can't really tell exactly what they're doing. So mm -hmm. if we assume that, yeah, they're going to have a, a, access to all of these documents, then I probably would. Let me take this out. And the that, same with, I mean, as um, as Jason was saying, on the one hand, 300 people, okay, well, they must be doing some in-depth work, but then you look at the staffing, it's like, how could they possibly be doing it? So that's sort of my issue with this application in general. I just, I just couldn't tell. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I have an answer, Jonathan. And uh, sorry, Jonathan, I read your screen. Eric, uh, the $77,000 uh, grant that they had ready for this app with, for the app that they were developing seems good but in hindsight looking that there are no other uh, funds and no other descriptions i was i think i was uh not as thoughtful as i would want to be so i'd probably be fine with this needs expectation Um, and just to confirm for guidance for the team, so for, for newer projects who are submitting uh, continuity planning, I don't anticipate that we'll have um, 
and, and exceeds in most instances, just because I think that's the category you look more closely uh, for continuing projects or maybe those seeking ex expansion. Um, it, it, they haven't begun the grant yet. So that's something we may look in a future grant year. Um, so as long as there's some, some response or, or some initial thoughts about the continuity plan and how to sustain it, would that warrant a, a meet in most instances uh, for the other, app, the other proposals? Yes, I think if okay. they if they've demonstrated some you know additional funding streams that they that they've secured to maintain the project ongoing and we're kind of matching other funding streams to make it happen, you know maybe that would be an exceed in my mind if they've okay. got that already locked in. Um, I know the public council grant has that, but they're kind of an expansion, so it's a little bit different. Great. Can I ask a question about that. Um, what about programs that identify a lot of unsuccessful efforts to find funding? That should be rewarded, I think. I'm not sure whether I, I would personally put that in exceeds. Um, I'd have to chew on that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't know if I would do exceeds, but maybe I, I would certainly appreciate it appreciate the effort and, and it would also depend on where they are because some places there's just no money that, that could warrant um i think a meets in some instances we might have um uh, noted some of the 2022 projects because we're using the same scoring rubric as both they didn't know anything and just said we can't find find funding but if you show a demonstrated history even though it was unsuccessful that might warrant that you've looked into it um and maybe would be at that meets threshold so Crystal, I, I think you can move Will to a six on continuity planning, if I heard it correctly. Yeah. Evaluation? Yeah. I sent my score, this is Joe, I sent my scores in a chat for project impact, admin, and project budget. Oh, thanks, Joe. Let's see what you did there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thanks. sure who's, who's populating this document. Thank you. And I would be a six on continuity planning as well. Anybody want to, you know, I'm, I'm surprised that staff in a way, I mean, you, you, your whole thing about court involvement being exceeds was the access to electronic access, which should have, I would think would have impacted evaluation because that's the whole benefit of that, right? But you gave them only a meets on evaluation. <laughs> Yeah, so looking at the evaluation requirements, it's that the um, project provide a satisfaction survey to the um, the, the, the self-represented litigants as well as one evaluative uh, method. And so that was the, um, the, so they have a satisfaction survey, which they included, and the additional evaluation method was reviewing court files. Um, what we talked about, and because there are there's a potential for um, double counting is that knowing that that was first particular section, we didn't want to give additional points in, an, in a, another section of the rubric if we had um, given some credit uh, in, in one section, just because then that would um, maybe have the impact of uh, inflating a score, for example. So we, we kept, that's how we, we kept them separate. This was a, a wide lens for me, but the um, since I'm also another an outlier again, uh, I thought the survey cart is seven simple questions. This is really encouraging. And if you look at the other survey cards, they are a thicket that would be intimidating and I think more difficult for to get a response, a high response rate. Um, they also mentioned that they will be gathering the data and analyzing it monthly and then sharing those statistics with the court personnel at quarterly meetings um, and uh, measuring the uh, data and efficiency for processing the document prep using their ICLS uh, app and the guided interview app and then um, bringing that back and using that. And then, yeah, the length of time to complete the guided interview. And I think these are metrics which I have seen nowhere else and while I agree with Eric's remark that it's, it's, it probably inflates slightly that I'm counting that usage of data, I think there's enough of a distinction between um, the court involvement piece and the evaluation piece. And 
maybe my expectations are just have been set so low that the fact that they're doing this is just really impressive that they're using they're going to look at successful filings that was the other piece um based on their electronic access well, i guess i guess where i they didn't really say that they were going to do that they're just going to look at the number of filings yeah. right who cares? They said the impact of the clinic can be evaluated based on successful filings of litigants after receiving services. Well, oh, yeah. So maybe maybe they aren't, and that was fluff, and we should get clarification. Because if, if they are actually doing the retrospective piece of the evaluations, then I would say my evaluation would be down. It would be meets expectations. But if they are doing the retrospective pieces that they're talking about, then I would say exceeds. And to what I think Elizabeth's question has been along all along. That's where my differentiating um, score is. So if we can get clarification on that, it might actually lower my score. Yeah, I mean, I would agree if they actually are going to devote resources to doing some kind of an analysis of filings and success rates, that would be an exceeds. I agree with that, but I don't, I didn't really see that here. Also, is it clear that they're going to use the guided interview app? No, it's like we hope we're going to get the money and yeah. we're going to try to develop it. I'll just say we, the Judicial Council, has divide, designed a number of guided interview apps that we can that are available, obviously at no charge, mm. and and have um, one is for Riverside. I don't know, you know, what's different, which, but there are there are definitely. Um, both uh, there's a program called Guidance File that many courts are using, and then um, we d we uh, use a program called Hot Docs um, that are both designed to help people. So I think even if hopefully uh, again I don't know what what they need that's different, but um, presumably there would be some way for them to use a guided interview. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, th this is Joe. I I, I found quite. Their description of what they're going to do um, by checking the court files to be very vague. They say that the impact of the clinic can be evaluated, mm -hmm. and they say that um, access to the electronic case registry and documents can be com say complied. I think they mean compiled, but they don't say they will, right? And it, this kind of vagueness actually flows throughout the entire proposal, yep. and and. I'm I'm left with some concern about what exactly are they proposing here, um, and not just not just the evaluation, but but the core services as well. Yeah. <coughs> and and that stands in just to finish a thought and. I apologize if I'm going on at too much length. It stands in stark contrast to the other two proposals that we have for today, which I thought were quite specific and concrete. Yeah, Bill. I think that's an excellent point. Um, I read, and maybe I, I gave them too much credit, that they have 77,000 for grant funding to the for the use of the app. But if that's not true, and if they don't intend to do these retrospectives, I would revise my scores downward, to be clear. So I think the issues raised here would make me want to ask questions to get the clarity here, and then it would probably impact my scoring. And hopefully that helps clarify for staff. Okay. Joe, where were you on evaluation? I would be a three. Because I I'm, I have concerns. I can be talked out of that if we get further information. But based on what I see here, I'm a three. Do we want to? Is, is innovation the next? Oh, we got funding priority. Funding priority. Right. I just wanted to confirm because I think um, that ranged a little bit. Uh, as a reminder, this is a multiplier by three, so one through five, uh, or sorry, multiplier by four. So uh, we had three, four, and five as the. Um, as the, the different scores. So I just wanted to get um, everyone's like input as to how they landed on a particular number. And that made that will give us some guidance uh, when we look at the other proposals. 
Yeah, I was a little confused about this because I, I think I was thinking that historically we like to give preference to new projects. Maybe I'm thinking about this incorrectly though, because the typical partnership grant has a five-year life cycle. And we, and we like them to phase out by the fifth year, at least that's the idea. But this maybe is different. Is this a different, should this be thought about differently than that? Um, that was a discussion we had on, on staff and um, maybe there are some nuances that we, the, the scoring team can, uh, we can consider and maybe we can discuss now. Um, because if you look at it, majority of the projects are new. So by de default, does that mean there's a five? Um, that would be a five or what are their uh, factors? Um, uh, did you all think of where you landed at a four or a three? Because um, because typically if we receive this in the annual, the yearly grant and it was a new project, um, they would normally land at the five. Uh, but I don't know if that will wash out if we give um, all of the new projects a five. Um, so what, what were some yeah, other yeah. Like, uh, distinguishing points for, for you all? Oh, that's a good point. So maybe- That's what I give, that's why I gave it a four. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I wonder, I gave it a four, but I kind of heavily weighted that it was new, but you know, you reminded us or me that it really all of them are new, I guess, yeah. right? So maybe we should think about it differently and just think about the quality, just the quality of this, the relative quality of these projects. If we were thinking about it that way, I'd probably give them a three. Well, they're also rural, right? In large part. Yeah. So that's, that's in the substantive area, I think should have a little bit, have some weight. Well, but right, I, I think as opposed to what when you say the substantive area, this is family law. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that should that should be maybe privileged a little bit. No, so, I'm just saying like what's the need in the county for family law or or any substantive area of law, right? Uh, what's the need? Whether whether this is meeting that need, uh, I, I think might be a consideration. Right. It's, it, I I I. Don't think it uh, because we don't have that new category. I know that this committee has um, privileged like areas of law in the past. I know you've looked at like disaster or re in responding to disasters and that sort of thing. So that's that's just another point I'm raising. That don't forget about the substantive area. Well, I this is Joe. I actually I, I've been pretty critical of this project on, on some other metrics. I would give it a four here because the need is really critical in my view. They propose to, I have some questions about how effective they'll be at, at achieving it, but they propose to help uh, uh, people, uh, indigent or low income people in a critical area, which is family law, focusing on victims of domestic violence. And that's pretty laudable, I think. Um, I happen to, I don't know what the what the number of pro se litigants is in Riverside. I know in Los Angeles family court, it's more than 50% are pro se and I assume it's a similar percentage out in Riverside. So I it, see a it, uh, six, uh, two thirds in Riverside. Right. It's probably even higher. So mm -hmm. I see a significant need and I, I really like the emphasis on helping victims of domestic violence because it's kind of hard to think of a more worthy uh, group of people to help than that. So I, I would give them a four on priority. I'll stick with a four. <clears throat> And then so just hypothetically, what would warrant a, a five? Would that be a project that scored exceeds in, in multiple categories or how? Yeah, I, I think so. I okay. think it would be a, be a better quality project to me would be a five. Yeah, I would, I would be a five if I didn't have questions about how effectively they're going to be at serving that very important goal. And I have I have obsessive compulsive disorder. So can I ask that we add an end? And in. Oh, yes, yes, yes. They, they, they updated one of I feel our, so much um, better now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Will, go ahead. So, one of the, I think, um, issues that came up with me last year when we discussed funding priorities is that I didn't limit the scope of my um, um, rating to the three items on the page. I did think more broadly about the program and the project, but my understanding was we were to keep a narrow focus on funding priorities and the ideas around rural areas responsive to emergency or disaster, or they're high functioning and highly utilized. 
and whether they were seed uh, project or so whether it was seed funding for new projects. So I um maybe this is the struggle I have with the rubric in general. I didn't take into account those concerns that I have, which would have lowered my rating for funding priority because it was based on just these pieces here. So in terms of consistency, what do we want to do as a committee? I mean, well, I think that, that, that that's a fair point and that's why um, I wanted to raise it at the beginning because um, staff had also scored it according to those three things, but we also want to be mindful um, Whereas the typical partner grants are, 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 are varied continuing grants, and that's where the timing would really play a factor because these are majority of new projects. Um, if we follow, if we kept with those past guidelines and that, that approach, um, majority of the projects will land at a five. So you, it would be harder for looking overall to distinguish between, um, you know, uh, stronger proposals versus not as strong proposals. So I think it's it's fair it's it's fair for the committee to consider this as initial con, uh, considerations for this for this funding um, funding opportunity just because it's 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 very different than what we've had before. And I think the rubric does allow some flexibility on how it's interpreted. Um, and I don't know if that's <laughs> if that well, makes I, sense. I guess but. my problem with it is that we're we're doing this rubric based on transparency. We want to mm -hmm. provide provide transparency to the program. So if we are taking into account um, the rest of the evaluation rubric in evaluating funding priority, it feels like we're not granting the transparency that we should, which is what we're considering should be on the page there. Does that make sense? I don't think we can. I mean, I'm fine with it. It just says consider these three. It's to, in my mind a, a priority that the quality of the app is totally appropriately considered, especially to differentiate the applications. I, I'm okay with that as long as we say that on the rubric that the the, the so quality you would think of the app. Everything that that we have to that, that that is appropriately considered should be on this paper because then we're going to end up with a big old book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't say everything needs to be just like the main the critical point um, and the quality of the application, I think is is critical. And if we're going to put it into funding priority, I, I just struggle so much with the rubric and um, because I really want it to be useful to the program. And so that means I, I try to be guided by what's written down there. And if that is gonna be something we weigh heavily and it sounds like it is, then why not just put it down there and include it that the quality of the application is included in funding priority. Yeah, if, if I understand what you're saying, I'm, I might be misunderstanding, I apologize. What, what does the rubric say on this funding priority? Does keeping the funding priorities in mind determine the number of points you wish to score this project and then multiply by the number? So to me, that's like, yeah, we're looking at these three, but keeping those in mind, I mean, I just think we're going to open up a can of worms by adding a quality of the application bullet point in there. Isn't that kind of obvious that that's a, that's a factor into a lot of these categories? Well, and we can't change the rubric now. Uh, that's a right. good point too. So, <laughs> right. I, I, I certainly understand that. I, it just sounds like that. My, my fear with rubrics in general is when hidden metrics sneak in, and if we're we're not doing, we're not doing anybody any favors. That's. I, I don't see how anybody could really seriously take issue with our incorporating the quality of the of the proposal into funding priority. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna um, share. Okay. I have the RFP right now, um, just for reference. Um, so we have the rubric below, but above gives some context. But I just wanted to call out this this line um, under funding priorities. <clears throat> um, Hold on, I had the line and then I scrolled, sorry. <laughs> but it does reference, you know, it's it's discretionary. Um, the committee does the, has discretion. And then we're also looking at project strength. Um, the, 
that the discretionary nature of partnership grants under which the commission's decisions on continued funding may be contingent upon projects meeting programmatic administrative and financial expectations. Discretion is, is something that we've, we've mentioned and that, that gives the committee latitude. It's just with PG 2.0, there's additional considerations that we typically would not have in our, our standard grants. Like there's, it's a, it's a different um, sort of a group of applicants that we're considering. So we're, we're trying to, to adjust this as appropriate, um, yeah, this, this funding category. <clears throat> yeah, I absolutely understand. I, I guess the um, what I heard during the development process of the rubric was that we really um, want to save the discretion, our application of our discretionary authority till we finish the rubric so that we could provide the most objective um, responses to the programs possible. Um, uh, did I misunderstand that? In terms of when discretion is, a, is applied, um, well, is that what you're asking? Correct. Um, I don't, Elizabeth, I'm trying to... Um, because I, I agree, I agree with um, Eric and Christina that the overall quality is something I would take into account and I think it's important. And it's something I just thought we did when we were making decisions on the final distributions, like what the, the money was, not in the funding priority. I think we're doing, and frankly, I think we're doing, doing it at every stage. Yeah, I guess uh, my question is, you know, when we're, when we talk about overall quality or quality of the application, what do we really mean? Like that it's well written? I mean, that like, um, I don't no, know, no. That, 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 that what we're looking for in each category is what is communicated clearly. I think that's what, what one thing that we're looking for, right? Yes. Um, so I think if we're gonna, so, and you know, going back to what um, Eric, your comment about the evaluations and being surprised that the staff score wasn't higher, um, you know, one of our, uh, so our thinking in you know the calibrating is that we wouldn't um, uh, like double double count certain things. You know we we gave it an exceeds in court involvement, but and but then gave it a meets and evaluation. Um, so I I mean I think I think we need to if we're if quality of application is is going to be a priority for the committee, we need to define that a little more. Um, I think we do take it into account um, throughout the other categories. So then maybe it isn't appropriate for funding priority if, if the goal is not to overinflate these scores um, and double count. So, I mean, th those are just my initial thoughts. But it, it isn't, I don't think we're talking about necessarily about quality of the application. We're talking about the quality of the service that, it, that the project proposes to deliver as best we can discern it from the application. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, but, so it's, not, it's, but, not, but, it's not a writing test. It's, right. It's okay. So, what they're, what they're so doing. The, I, I mean, I think that's that's the the point I'm trying to make. Like, we need to be clear on like what it means. Like, what is that? What and and that, you know, my question next would be like, so quality of the services. How are we rating that? Right. Are See, we that's my issue. It's like, just don't even go to go there. <laughs> don't. It's all kind of inherent in what in in the whole process to me. I mean, I think a lot of us have expressed concerns about what this organization is going to be doing yeah. based upon what we're reading. And I think we're factoring that into funding priority and it seems appropriate to me for us to do that. Uh, Jason and then Will. So I, I have to agree with Eric. I think the, the core concept of funding priority has to be bound to a, a metric that we're using to scale this relative to other applications in you know, output of the program relative to other potential uh, programs and their output um, for, for the dollars that we're spending, right? Uh, is it going to produce a desired result um, from a project relative to other projects that are competing for the same resources? Um, I would ask staff, I mean, given the, the scoring, I mean, I think where I struggle with, I left it at, at a three because I felt like, well, there's nothing, you know, that really jumps out at me that's, you know, uniquely distinct here versus others. You know, uh, providing family law document prep is useful, but I don't know if it should be more priority. Um, query as to what's a three, two, or one, you know, kind of the inverse of the question staff was asking for metrics, you know, what's a four or five? I have the opposite query. 
Yeah. Right? If every if everything's a three, four, or five, well, then we might as well mix the two and one. <laughs> yeah, Will. Thank you. I wanted to get the maybe a perspective that would help you understand why I'm harping on this, which is if I had taken in to account all of my concerns with the possibility that this thing would actually work, I would have given them a three. I did not because of our robust discussions on the rubric and the purpose of the rubric and transparency and what this category should mean. And so what it means here, like the distinction I'm trying to make affects my, my score. I would go with three, not five, if we take into account the like whether I think they're actually going to pull off all the things that they said they're going to pull off. Um, and maybe it comes down to just the clarifications. Maybe the step that we're missing here is we have a lot of questions about the ambiguous statements that they've made, myself included. And if they clarified, maybe it would be a lot easier to uh, score and find the differentials here that would affect what that outcome is. Um, well, D, okay. Any other comments? I'm trying to be to be mindful of time here. We, you know, we're still on this project. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with the four where I am. Can I, can I make a suggestion, Eric? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, perhaps because this project seems to be, you know, the most difficult, perhaps if we moved on to other projects and run through those, we'll have a better sense of funding priority. And then we can come back to this just because this, I think this was the hardest um, of the batch. Yeah. Um, and so maybe if we go through some of the ones that there's more consensus on, we will have a clear understanding and then apply that, that sounds to later. I'm happy to do that. Do we want to, do we want to talk about innovation though? Cause that's boy, if you, if we had problems with funding priority, we're yeah, I, I feel like maybe we should table both of those because the, those there are, they are the two areas with the biggest spreads right now. And so, and come back. I, well, I, I just want to say Bonnie's remark on the fact that there are other apps available to do document prep. I wasn't aware of that. And so this seemed more innovative to me. So I would knock my my score down um, to, I, I think to five, my innovation score down to five based on the fact that there are other apps. I just I just didn't didn't know. So now that I know, I it's not as an innovative. Thank you. Thanks for that, Will. All right, let, let's let's take um, Elizabeth's great suggestion and move on to we'll table we'll table funding priority and innovation on this one and move on to uh, mental health. And is it our mental health or is it the mental health of people in Los Angeles that we're going to be talking about here? <laughs> do, does anybody want to take like a three minute break? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we do that? Why don't we come back? Let's make come back at 1150. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So important it is to ask for as much money as possible. <laughs> and, and then just hope. It doesn't matter. Just ask for as much as possible. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll share my screen again for uh, mental health advocacy services, but just a reminder, this is a um, let me share my screen first. You're a little, you're a little early, Crystal. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't have accurate timing on my, my devices. <laughs> so I'm going to pause for... the recording since we're not back yet. Man. <laughs> but Jason, Jason has a commitment. So Jason, do you want to quickly give us your your input on the, the remaining two projects? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll, since we're on M-House right now, I'll kind of, and I'm the outlier, um, my biggest concern, and I might have been reading into it too much, um, it seemed like the M-House proposal was conflating what I would call justice partner organizations with the court, uh, uh, to wit, the public defender's office. <clears throat> Um, and whenever they're referring to court partners, it's like including the public defender, if not primarily the public defender. And I'm like, well, that's not the court. So 
I wasn't really sure how to gauge court involvement in that. I know that uh, uh, Judge Jaskell is, is you know, associated with it in some ways. So um, presumably there's something that I, I you know is going on that I wasn't seeing there, but that's kind of why the scores were a little bit more critical because it seemed that you know, the partnership was more of an association kind of through the DA to work on, you know, through mental health courts or whatever. You mean with um, the public defender? Public yeah, through the public, yeah, yeah, through the public defenders. I mean, there was some uh, mention of, you know, you know, as, as with most mental health courts, you're going to have DA, PD, um, judge present. And so, yeah. you know, I see that as a, as a somewhat like wraparound kind of service offering, which is a good thing. Um, but I'm not sure, I didn't understand from the application, the level of court involvement and connection outside of kind of being connected with the mental health court offering. Um, I, I, so that's where I was a little bit more critical. I, I think they're, they're going to be represented in mental health court, that's criminal courtroom. So they're going to be represented by the public defender for that. But I read that all of the ancillary civil services that these people need, that's what they're going to be providing. Which is great, and I'm glad, and I'm happy to see that. I just, from a court involvement, which you know I'm low compared to the uh, rest of the group, I think that's where the question is like, so what's the like? Describe to me what the court involvement is there, because the mention it's mentioning specifically the public defender's office in that, uh, which presumably they'll have to coordinate because the public defender is representing the client in in those uh, criminal courtrooms. But it didn't seem clear to me what the court involvement was. So it was a little bit more critical in that aspect. Um, and I think I was generally, I, I didn't see any of these projects as necessarily super innovative to go to the innovation piece and funding priority was neutral on all of them too for all of my scores. Um, so I kind of just was across the board like that. Um, getting to the other program, um, the public council, the biggest concern I had with that one was the large amount that was associated with uh, admin overhead costs. Everything else, like it seemed like a great program and I scored it pretty high as a result. Um, but the project budget and that amount uh, seemed a little bit high. If it was, if we could cap it or reduce the funding amount or something like that um, on the admin side. Um, I know uh, Daniel was talking about potentially some policy discussions about uh, broader policies related to ICRP. Uh, if there was some cap there, I would be a whole lot more comfortable with saying like, oh, it's 20% or whatever. And so that's the max of your reimbursement for those admin uh, costs. But otherwise, I thought it was a great program and uh, something that we should move forward with. And okay, Jason, so that's can great. Can I ask a question of Jason? Um, so in terms of um, the indirect costs, if we go back and they're able to justify that, you know, all these indirect costs are directly related to this are related somehow to this um, to the uh, pro project? Would would that satisfy you, or do you want? Are you saying that I'm, there needs to be a cap? Because um, we really don't, we, yeah. as a policy, we don't have a cap on indirect costs, uh, and we're not going to develop the policy that Dan brought up uh, for at least a year, uh, I think, or it would come and be in effect for at least a year, and we would obviously obviously have to give all applicants notice of it. Um, so um, I just want to get I, a little clarity. I think by its nature, ICRP would have to be indirect uh, cost, um, unless they're like if they were to highlight a direct connection and write down some of their ICRP costs, right, as directly attributable to the project, okay, um, and reduce it. That would alleviate some of my concerns. I just think that you know, while the project is good, thirty percent is a really high amount to go in okay. the admin bucket. Um, yeah, I understand yeah. that. So, so, so a direct connection would would um, maybe alleviate some of your concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think that I'm okay with some overhead, and I think that's fine. I put in my comments, you know, if it was twenty percent, I would I wouldn't have really batted an eye because that's cap. That's a cap that's in place elsewhere with federal budgets and otherwise. Um, so, I know that recognizing that's not a policy that's in place, but I think that that would make me a lot more. Okay, or that's if they helpful. were to modify their rules. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. I know you have to, to, to go out for your uh, noon meeting. Um, yeah. Eric, should I go back to MHAS, Mental Health Advocacy Services? Yeah, I guess. I'm almost half tempted to do public counsel first, though. Maybe. But oh, I, either way works. <laughs> let's do public counsel. It's more plain vanilla and maybe less controversial. 
So this is a this is an expansion of a current project. They're already doing a guardianship uh, clinic, and this would be an expansion of that project, as I understand it. Yes. They're going to hire an attorney essentially to enable the project to be more accessible on a remote basis. So, um, yeah, anybody want to weigh in? I mean, I, I thought it was a great project personally. Yeah, I, I, I'll weigh in uh, and echo Eric's comment. So, I'm, actually, I'm pretty familiar with the need here because I. I co-chair my firm's pro bono immigration practice group, and I'm in family court and probate court a lot on guardianships because that's a step to getting a form of immigration relief called special immigrant juvenile status. And I, so I'm familiar with the requirements for service in the case of a guardianship, and they're onerous. Um, you, you got to, you, because you're terminating the rights of the natural parents and you've got to serve them and you've got to serve any siblings and grandparents. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and it, it's hard for Munger Tolls not to trip up <laughs> on this. And I can't imagine what it's like for pro se litigants. So uh, I think, and I've seen often that judges have had to continue hearings because one or more. Uh, dots weren't crossed. No, was whatever you cross, <laughs> your T's weren't crossed. You didn't dot your eyes, and so I. And, and public counsel, I think, has a lot of experience in this area, and I. So I have a lot of confidence in their ability to to do this effectively. So I see clear need, benefit to the court as well as to litigants, and and a thorough and thoughtful uh, plan for for attacking this real problem. So are, are you exceeds on all these things? Yeah, I would I would give me the highest score on each of these. I guess I'm a 20. Um, I wish I could do 29. That would be but mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Um, and then Jeff, for the remaining categories, did you want to um, do you have your, your numbers? I can input them quickly. Or oh, for me, um, is, yeah, yeah, I. I I, I don't really have a strong view on admin. I might be a six there, but then I would be a 10 on budget, a 10 on planning, a 10 on evaluation, and on funding, I would, I would be a 20. Okay. Um, just to call out, um, I think we mentioned this earlier, this was the the proposal that had the, the least variance, if we're looking at numerically. Um, uh, I think this top half here, I think we're within a few points of each other. Um, unfortunately, Judge Jaskel is not in the call. So um, I don't, um, we, can't, we can't really get her perspective for how she landed up the 71, but I, I see maybe funding priority um, may have played uh, a factor for this particular project. Um, oh, do I, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do I owe you an innovation score? I'd, if, I'd be if you one, have one, yeah. One. And that way you can total me, right? There you go. A one for what? Uh, there's two ones up there. For innovation. Yeah. I mean, why? Um, I'm just curious. Oh, just because um, I think they saw a particular need and came up with a creative way to resolve it. The, the, the need being get more effective interface with uh, the probate investigator's office so that we can um, we can get the notices done in a timely manner. I think that's what they were proposing to do. To schedule appointments, um, to schedule the follow-up appointment on the guardianship papers on the same day as the probate investigators uh, thing is gonna happen so they can ensure follow-up and be sure that everybody gets served before the hearing. That was pretty good, I thought. Okay, should we run through each of the categories, um, Eric, and then see if there's any uh, outliers and, and discuss? Yeah, that? Like, can, I, can I just say briefly on budget, I, I tend to agree with what Joe said, it, but I, my, my, my reason it was a meets is exactly the reason that uh, Jason mentioned. I was concerned about the admin as well. It seemed really high. So I'll keep it at a six for now, but if, if they can satisfy us that, there's, that that number makes sense, I, I would bump it up. Their budget was so detailed. That's what I appreciated about it. 
and they didn't just throw in numbers like most of them do. They they showed us how they were calculated. Yeah. Although it's funny, you know, not funny. I was kind of shocked to see that the assumption in the detail was really it was really uh, instructive. But they they used a salary for a third year attorney of sixty six thousand dollars, which I thought, wow, God, that's low. Sixty six thousand dollars for a third year attorney. Whoa. I think uh, I think that's profit. That's for nonprofit. I think that's pretty much it's what it went. And, and and I also really appreciated the detail on the budget. And I the reason I'm a 10 there is because I want to reward that. Yeah, <laughs> right? me too. It was a real budget. Right. <laughs> With the, the thought went into an actual facts. Oh, oh Jeff, 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 Jeff. That's good. Hi. All right. Yeah, we yeah, we can okay, Crystal, we can go through each one. Sure. I don't okay. have anything more to say about court involvement. Uh, court involvement, uh, majority, we're at uh, 20 for exceeds. Um, Will, don't mean to call you out, but just uh, for the outlier score the meets, I'm just wondering how, what your thought process was um, in giving this project a meets versus an exceeds. So I, um, I really struggled <laughs> with this one as well, but I, um, I actually feel like they have such a huge incumbent advantage because they've have a 20 year program with the court where they've been inside the court for so long that it felt unfair to um, give them an exceeds when honestly, I, I, based on their description and their history, this is the what I would expect. It meets my expectations for somebody who's been there for 20 years. And if I give them extra points for that incumbent advantage, it feels like it's unfair to new programs who are just trying to get in the door. So I, I bias towards, yes, you're doing, you're meeting the expectations, you're doing an excellent job of that, and that's awesome, but I don't want to say to a program that's been around for 20 years that you have a great history, and so you're we're working with a court, and so Maybe that's unfair though. So I guess I, I, I want some feedback on that because- I think that's unfair. They've been there long, they've worked They've worked at it and now it's excellent. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with Christina that um, uh, it is a bit unfair because it does take uh, a lot to cultivate relationships with the court. Um, and even if it, you know, having a 20 year relationship, I think is remarkable. I'm just I think that's up a really the fair point. So I will. Um, I think I will modify it based on on that because I I was really wobbling. I was like, ooh, the incumbent advantage is really strong, but um, it, it it does. It has minimal weaknesses, and I think if I look at that definition, uh, your point is well taken. So I'd I'd modify it to twenty. Thank you. What about project the project impact? I, I was, you know, as usual, motivated largely, but not totally, by the numbers, which were quite impressive. Over, over 3,000, um, yeah. almost 3,700 um, projected services. And then I think they also did a great job about um, talking about the consolidation of the LA courts and um, the the needs of the increased number of proper litigants seeking assistance at the, the Moss Courthouse as well, um, which bumped us up to an exceeds. Uh, so it looks like Christina and Judge Jaskel are the outliers. I, I, I could be persuaded to go up. I am persuaded to go up. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Yeah, I, I'm actually surprised that it lists me as uh, 15. I, but um, uh, uh, just as a as a disclosure a reminder, I, I worked at public mm -hmm. council for nine years, uh, so I certainly have a lot of confidence in this proposal. And um, uh, but that said, I I, I would want to bump up the uh, my vote on project impact. Well, we actually all agree on something. That's a first. 
All right. Should have done this one first. I know. You should. <laughs> How about admin? I was a meets on that, but I, you know, I could probably be persuaded. Why? Um, it seemed like it was great. Well, it's know. it's fine, isn't it, for half of us to be at six and half of us to be at ten? I mean, that's how you're going to get yeah. different yeah. numbers. <laughs> Yeah, no, we don't necessarily have to talk about it unless people want to. Well, why, just 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 real briefly for those that rated it exceed, Christina, why did you rate it a ten? Um, come back to me. Okay. Anybody else? I think this is where I really their history spoke to me they found oh. it well they have it and they're going to add attorneys it, it looks like to yeah because so. they're going to have lawyers doing the work um and yeah. overseeing this i'm always much more impressed than when it's a really just really a paralegal it looked like they were they were going to have good lawyer involvement and good lawyer supervision anything more on this one or move on to project yes, I guess just for guidance for for admin, like if if the scoring team uh, hypothetically is at a, a standstill, are there any elements that um, would help us distinguish between like at a meets versus an exceeds um, for the other proposals? I, I think for on the staff end for admin, we were also um, impressed with the the onsite attorney. There's a lot of staff supporting this project, um, so. This, this number of staffing, for example, um, would that impact administration of, of a project if there's a lot of staff, volunteers, et cetera, um, would that be persuasive or justification enough to give an exceeds, for example? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Especially for me, the more lawyers, the more lawyer time they have on a project, the better. Okay. Yeah, I echo that. Wow, <laughs> you really should have started with this one. <laughs> the more lawyer time, I've, I've run into too many people who gave me the wrong advice. And then finally, I got to talk to the attorney who said, yeah, they were wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, hours wasted. Um, Eric, I think next is project budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've already discussed a little bit. Mm. I have. Jason gave, gave us reason for his concerns with the uh, admin personnel. Um, so that's why he was the outlier. Mm -hmm. uh, Will. I too had concerns. It was that the administration seemed expensive. Also, $2,000 laptops for document prep seemed expensive to me as well. My, my $1,000 laptop can do document prep. I don't understand. No, they're, I don't think that's, personally, I don't think that's too much. You want a good one. <laughs> but that thing's going to be, a, it's going to be working all the time. You know what? That's a good point. And it needs a big brain, a big hard drive, a lot of RAM. Right, you don't want to skimp me. on. You convinced me. Yeah. <laughs> So for, 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 for what I'm hearing, I think, so project budget was one of the areas where um, we wanted just a little bit clarification on what an exceeds would be. But I think I heard from the committee, like it was very detailed and clear in how the expenses were um, calculated or the, the budget was calculated. As, would that be enough to, to bump it up to an exceeds? I don't think we'll see that often, but if there's something similar, a budget similarly situated, um, pending uh, answering their question about the admin personnel, would that be enough for an exceeds just for the review team? Us, that the scoring team to take into consideration. I I actually feel like that. If we have questions, they should be answered. But if detailed budget is going to be, I think that's rating the quality of the application, not the quality of the program. And so, I wouldn't use that as a differentiator. Okay. I think if we have questions about budget, they need to be answered. Um, but if we want to make detailed budget a requirement or a factor in the rating, then we should say that. 
Yeah, I, I think I come out differently. As I said earlier, I really appreciated the detail in the budget. And it, it's not just that they put a bunch of numbers down. It's right. that they went to the level of detail and analysis to 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 come up with a very detailed budget. Because that doesn't happen. I mean, I assume someone didn't just plug numbers randomly into a computer. My, my sense from this overall proposal is that these are numbers arrived at through a rigorous process and their willingness to engage in that process and then share the results with us in detail is commendable. And I think it gives us some assurance they're going to spend the money wisely. I think that's an excellent point. If, if that is something that we're going to include when rating project budget, then I, I guess I would actually probably go up on my score as well because the the detail there was commendable, but I didn't feel like it. Uh, when I looked at successful project clearly reflect how partnership grant funds are tied to the actual project expenses or directly related costs. Um, it didn't seem to, to cross the threshold for me in terms of reflecting on how successful the project will be. But I think I, I think I might be convinced here. Well, uh, yeah. we well so that will that be a 10 then for you for project budget or I think so, yeah. I think we're wearing you down, Will. <laughs> Will, stand your ground, man. <laughs> we no, need you. I I remember last year, Justice Murray. You know, we went back and forth on uh, our in, in our little huddle, and you know, I can be convinced. They're very convincing people. So I appreciate the discussion, and I think that's what's helpful for me in actually solidifying my scores understanding history and innovation, all the, the other pieces that I just don't have experience with. So thank you. Continuity planning. Well, before we leave budget, Eric, I, I, before we leave budget, Eric, I just want to point out that um, they do have a very a generous benefits package. So the, the salary isn't, isn't great, but the benefits look like they're really thorough. <laughs> Okay. All right. Medical, dental, vision, life, long-term disability, payroll, professional liability insurance, and retirement. So. Right. Hey. <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't work there for sixty-six thousand as a third-year attorney. It's it's really tough. I mean, it's and, and like a, there's a lot of public interest firms that that have a similar salary structure, and it's. It's tough. They don't yeah, do I mean, it for the money. You can't live on it. You can't live comfortably on that salary in LA. You've got to be in some kind of. Oh, no, you can't. You got to be in a have a partner who you're yeah. sharing with. So moving on to continuity planning, it looks like we're mostly at an exceeds a couple of outliers uh, for the meets. I think just for the staff team, I'll go ahead and get started. It's just that they identified and were very clear in terms of their efforts and what they were able to secure to sustain the, the project. Um, then, uh, so that's why we were at an exceeds uh, for this category. Um, they didn't, they haven't gotten any of them yet, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, they're, they're, they're already using a lot of other money for this project um, when you look at their budget. Oh, that's a good point. Actually, I, I couldn't tell from, from their budget when they talked about other state bar monies and other non-state bar monies. Did that mean for this expansion or for just generally for the guardianship project? I would think for the whole project. Hmm. I guess I would too. That, that's a good follow-up question that we can clarify just because it's, it's different than new projects who are just seeking the project and this is the expansion. So but you know, I mean, I guess maybe this is where I'm bringing in my outside knowledge, but frankly, if anybody can get outside money to continue a project, public council can. Uh, th th this project's budget is very specific to the staff members and the specific software package that they want to implement. 
So I thought this was a very focused budget on, on the expansion. I'm happy to raise my um, rating actually across the board. I think I may have been bending over backwards uh, not <laughs> to over, over rank um, my, my former firm, um, but I'm, I'm happy to go up to um, what everyone else has. For um, admin as well, Judge Jasko? Yeah. You guys want to should we talk about evaluation or do you want to be done with continuity planning? Any more comments on that? Why did you guys, Joe, why did you think that they met merited and exceed on evaluation? Oh, uh, um, I don't remember to be honest. Maybe, I, may, maybe I'm actually just a meat. Let's, I would change me to meats on that. I'm going to just scroll down to just check. Yeah, again, we were looking at that, um, what they had put for the requirement and, and what they've done. So they had that satisfaction survey and then the follow-up call with litigants is the additional evaluation tool. Um, it, for, for staff's assessment, it, di it didn't really rise to, to being an exceeds. It, it didn't meet the requirements. So... Um, that's yeah, that was know. actually, it, that was, that was the only aspect as I was looking at it again, just a few minutes ago that to me wasn't quite as exceptional. Well, maybe, but, I mean, I, I gave it the same rate ranking, but um, this may be a bit of a different situation from a smaller project where fewer people are assisted, it might be easier to you know, do focus groups or, or what, whatever ad, other bells and whistles you can do for evaluation. But th this is a pretty massive project and I, I'm, I, I'm not sure how to rank or rate that or consider that, but um, f given the number of people this project serves, it might not make sense to um, have a, a bigger uh, evaluation component. More people to evaluate, harder, more expensive. Well, that, that's probably why maybe in my case, I gave it a meets. I mean, yeah. I guess they're it's doing fine. what they should be doing, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not much else. That's fine. Um, all right. So, uh, We'll bring up the <laughs> elephant again, funding priority. Uh, um, I will say just for, for, for staffing, um, we were at um, an eight, I just some considerations like this, this expansion um, with, with that in turn um, reset the, the, the clock um, just because this is an established project. So I think we're open. Uh, of course, we're open to, to adjustments, but once you hear the committee in terms of how you landed in terms of funding priority for for guardianship clinic expansion. I, I'm not following why you, it, this was an eight below expectations. Uh, well, above. It's, it's not a above or below, it's a one through five. So um, we, we staff gave it a, a calibrated score of two um, just because it's of its length of project. Um, but, you know, open if an expansion would, would warrant a, a, a higher score, like a, a, a five, for example, is, would that reset the clock? Cause it's, it's an expansion. <clears throat> I, this was a tough one because of exactly what you described on I it had been explained to me previously that when they a long running project does something new that I should count it as new. I'm not sure about that, but in this case, I used uh, bullet point number two high functioning and heavily utilized project as the justification to rank it for. And I think they clearly established that. Yeah, I mean, if you've got a project where we all acknowledge there's a huge need, they're meeting the need, not only effectively, they're exceeding expectations in the way they're meeting the need. They've got great coordination with the court. Um, I, I, can't, I can't see any justification for it too. That just seems wrong to me. 
Yeah, I, I, I spoke to this earlier, but I, what I loved about this project is that there's both a benefit to the litigants in expediting the guardianship process, but also a huge benefit to the court yeah. because they're going to see papers that are fully done and ready to go on the first hearing date instead of having to go over it and ding that well you didn't effectively serve this person and that person so now i've got to order you to come back and then they're going to have to review the papers a second time so it really promotes judicial efficiency in departments that are really overworked because there are so many pro se litigants so i i thought it was a, a dual benefit and therefore gave it a, the highest score and funding priority uh, sorry, Danielle, did you have your hand raised? Sorry, uh, trying to. I, I did, and then I lowered it, but um, I'll, I'll say it anyway. Um, that second bullet point does say a high functioning and heavily utilized project, but has, or high functioning and heavily utilized projects, but have been unable to secure alternate funding despite documented efforts. Um, and so I originally was going to say, does this fall into that category that they're having issues securing other funding? Um, but then as I thought through it, I suppose them requesting this grant maybe answers that question in the affirmative, which is why I then lowered my hand. But I just wanted to raise that um, for discussion. It's not just high functioning and heavily utilized projects. It's those that have been unable to secure other funding to continue. Um, my other follow-up question would just be the distinction between a, a five and a four. Um, just because of the multiplier, it does impact the total scores. Um, so if there's any guidance that the committee could give in terms of what a, a four or five would look like. I don't know if majority of the projects will, will end up in this realm, but if it does, if it does play a factor um, looking at the total scores, um, any additional guidance would be helpful. Well, I'm not I'm going to offer additional guidance, but okay. I, I am going to um, ask to raise my score. I'm not sure why I put down such a low number. Uh, so I'd uh, be happy to go up to, uh, let's see, uh, to 20. Yeah. You know, I actually... <laughs> To answer, to try to answer your question, I, I think uh, what Daniel Danielle mentions is that it <laughs> speaks to what is the purpose of the partnership grants, and if seed funding and that general idea is important, uh, and I think it is for this grant category, and I want to narrow my focus to this particular category and not just all of legal aid that that um, but have been unable to secure alternate funding despite document ep documented efforts. I think that does move me down to a three um, because uh, as Eric said, if public counsel is trying to get the money, they probably can. And for this pot of money, I think that that would make this less of a priority. So personally, I would think, right? Like <laughs> if I set aside the necessity of doing this rubric, I would just be like, this is great, let's fund it. Um, but if I focus in on the, the categories and the definitions here, then I, I think I would move to a, a three. Thank you. Well, <laughs> You know, to me, it seems like if you've got two projects that are delivering equal qualities of service, yeah, I would give priority to the to the project that's having more trouble getting funding for sure. But I mean, I I, I wouldn't necessarily privilege a project that maybe is providing mediocre service or not not that I should say mediocre, but service that doesn't call itself out as outstanding. But is having problems getting funding, I wouldn't privilege that one over a public council where we just have, uh, you know, agreement that they're just providing great service, great quality, huge impact. So I, I just think like this, 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 this is something we talked about with, with the other project, but I, I just think you have to include the quality of the project in this, in this priority assessment. Well, 
Eric, I agree 100% with you, but I got corrected a lot on uh, not taking, not narrowing my focus to what the category actually says. So I, I'm, I think if you changed, wanted to change the rubric, that would be fantastic to, to, to say that. But as long as it says that it should be a priority, I feel like that's why I have to move my score. It's one factor, but, but quality is also a factor. Discretion is also a factor. Right, and I was again told that we apply our discretion when making the final decision on funding, and we're trying to use the rubric to make sure that we are transparent and as objective as possible and not subjective. No, but our discretion is also a factor in, in assessing funding priority. I, um, so I, I don't know how to continue this conversation, but I just, um, just wanted to raise, we do have several projects that are expansions of current projects. If we're um, utilizing similar reason, uh, hmm. I'm just try, trying to think like hypothetically how this would go if you looked at the years funded as recorded on the rubric. Um, a lot of the projects would be um, in that three to five range is my is my um, guess. Um, but I don't know if that's, I don't know what that impact will have on, on total scores, but we could also, the committee could also look at the different um, categories in terms of impact, um, court involvement to, to help guide the funding recommendation decisions. Um, it, this is a very different discussion um, than we had last year because I think just the additional consideration of the, the the timing and the fact the majority of these are all new they're all new proposals um, it makes it a little bit tricky, in, in my opinion. I I actually considered this in my mind even though it's an expansion but they're doing different things with the money, hmm. so I considered it new. Maybe that was wrong. <laughs> I mean, they're hiring a lawyer to do in-person clinics. They're doing that collaboration with the probate investigator's office so that they don't have to keep continuing hearings. So that, that's why I considered it new. Well, how do we reach closure on this? Um, you know, we have, we have, we have the ratings that are here. Does anybody have anything more? I'm just concerned about time, frankly. It's already 1230 and we've got one more project to talk about. Well, it, it sounds like there are some factors that have been identified that staff is should be looking for for funding priority. You know, oh, you know, ex what, for example, what Christina just said in terms of like, uh, you know, a, new, a kind of a whole new activity that's being added as an expansion to a project should maybe be viewed as a new project. Um, and I, th I think there were some other comments earlier that maybe those are things that we can, uh, uh, areas that we can focus on in, in order to, to uh, rate this area. I mean, are there, are there others that haven't yet been discussed or raised that staff should be looking at? I just have a question. Actually, this is Joe. And if I'm supposed to be raising my hand instead of just leaping in, I apologize. So with this score where to and the amount of money that's available versus how much was requested where would this take us concretely would this be a grant for everything they've they've asked for given the the high score or just what are the, or some but, other resolution the high score is very favorable uh but we wouldn't be able to answer that question joe until we've evaluated all of the grants and have scores for the entire set so we look at Oh, good, Eric. Yeah, Joe, we would typically give the higher rated projects a higher percent. Very few people get 100% of their ask. Maybe some people do. Mm -hmm. But um, the higher the rating, the higher the percentages that you're likely to get. Right. And will that come back to this committee at a future meeting? Yes, that'll be on the yeah, February 16th. But got we're, it. Okay. On February 16th, we're going to have a list of projects ranked in order with funding recommendations. Right. Great. And I, I apologize for asking something that everybody else knew. No, I seem to be apologizing a lot today. Uh, Eric, should, should we move to our other one with 30 minutes left? But I was well, we should talk about innovation. We haven't talked about that yet. Mm. Um, I, I just wanted to add, 
Um, Eric, if that's okay. In addition to scoring, um, when we made the recommendations last year, we had a very robust discussion. So we looked at county serve substantive areas to ensure that the money was allocated in a way that the committee had um, agreement to in terms of looking if there's multiple projects in, in one county or maybe a new uh, a rural, rural counties as well. Those were, were factors. So scoring um, results are a factor, but we, we would look at it comprehensively. Um, to make sure it's allocated the way that the committee would would, would like it to be. Um, all right. So in the innovation, or sorry, Christine, I might have cut you off. Okay. I thought we talked about this. That's all. Did we not? No, maybe, I guess we did. We did ask you guys about that. So okay, I may have missed that. So if um, my score um, could be changed on innovation uh, to be consistent uh, and raise it to a one. Um, and that's that's because it's going to be working with the probate investigator. Um, is I assume that's the right. Okay, so I'll, I'll put a one. So so the range on innovation was one to 10? Yes. And, and um, staff may, be, may have been very generous when we gave the, the bonus points, but I think hearing the feedback as to why the committee is score, um, provided uh, points is, is very helpful. So I would say staff would also scale back um, as well to be consistent. Um, we just didn't know like where the weight would have been like to give a 10, for example, for innovation um, for the three so projects. The 10 sounds like the, the service would be given by a robot or something <laughs> in outer space on Mars. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to mental health, our own mental health, in addition to the mental health of Los Angeles County. Here, here. Should, should I um, should I absent myself from this part of the discussion? No, I don't think so. I mean, no. I don't, okay. I mean, I mean, I could probably provide some insights about how our mental health court works. Yeah, I think that would be helpful because I've never heard of the mental health court. Ah, okay. Hey, hey, Eric, it's it's Joe. If I could leap in just very quickly before we leave public counsel, the Judge Jaskol's, am I saying that right? Um, yeah. uh, her comment made me realize I probably should mention that I my firm does a lot of work with public counsel um, in the immigration area and also um, a part of our mind, Mike Solov does a lot of work with them and, and Section 8 housing stuff. So I don't think that's influencing me in any way. I, I know the head and I think the board chair is at Disney, I think, which is a firm client. So there are a lot of connections there. I don't think that's influencing me in any way, but I'm you're not, you're not on the board. You're not an employee right. of public counsel. You don't have a financial interest in the grant. So All true. All true. All right. Uh, once, I, I will apologize once again, this time for the introduction. <laughs> I'm sorry for the yeah, for the for interruption, I should say. Judge Jaskell, tell us about what, what is mental health court? Well, there are, um, so this is a, a fairly small courthouse located in Hollywood. There are four bench officers. Three of those bench officers handle competency matters mostly, not, not exclusively, but mostly. So when a, a criminal judge um, finds that there's a question about whether someone is competent to stand trial, those matters get sent over to the three competency court um, courtrooms in the mental health court. Uh, mental health court also had, the, the, for, for those three judges, um, they're also working on things like um, uh, civil commitments um, and um, uh, mentally disordered offenders, um, uh, so, but so those for those three, there's a sort of criminal approach. It's it's they're criminal basically because these people are involved in criminal cases. The 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 fourth um, uh, courtroom or in our courthouse is the one that I do, which is conservatorships under the Lantham and Petrus Short Act. So that means that. Um, for someone to uh, be placed in a conservatorship under the LPS Act, there uh, either a judge or a jury would have to find that that person uh, is gravely disabled due to a mental disorder, which means that the person uh, could not provide his or her food, clothing, or shelter uh, based on that as a result of the, the mental disorder. So um, the um, 
the project that uh, the mental health advocacy services is proposing um, would address each of those um, types of areas, is my understanding. Uh, and um, so, you know, I, I know most about the LPS court, but I, I, I do have some information about the other ones as well. Uh, in the LPS court, it's fairly high volume. Um, so we're, you know, uh, up to around between 55 and 60 matters on calendar every day. Um, and those are a combination of uh, essentially progress hearings uh, or, or pretrial hearings, getting the case ready to either resolve or to have a, a court trial or a jury trial. Um, uh, and then usually we have uh, up to six um, trials, court trials in the afternoon. Uh, so it's, um, it's a lot of resources. Uh, you know, we each each person has a public defender uh, unless they have their own private counsel. Um, and then uh, in the LPS portion of it, um, the county council represents the office of the public guardian. Uh, and the public guardian is the one who initiates uh, these LPS conservatorship petitions. Um, and th that's a whole other discussion. I don't know if we want to go into that, but um, so th then there's a process um, where either the person is conserved under the LPS statute or the case is dismissed. Um, but let me stop and see if I'm uh, answering the kinds of questions you have or if there's something else. Great. So you, you're a judge in that court now, currently? Yes, I, I am, in fact, the only um, judge who handles LPS conservatorships in Los Angeles. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's... It, um, but that's, you know, that's why it's a heavy calendar. Um, wow. The other thing I, I should mention, and um, especially since I'm in the middle of doing it today, is um, my, my court, uh, I handle the um, something called assisted outpatient treatment, which is a, a fairly recent development. Um, and what it is, is it's a way for people to get mental health services without being in a conservatorship. So uh, there are a variety of criteria that um, that the uh, Department of Mental Health has to meet in order to get somebody into the assisted outpatient treatment program. Uh, and um, so uh, one, basically three quarters of every Friday now, um, I handle this assisted outpatient treatment calendar um, people can either voluntarily agree to have the outpatient treatment, um, but if they don't, then we schedule a trial. And um, the, the uh, standard is if um, the Department of Mental Health has presented clear and convincing evidence that the person would benefit from the AOT program. Um, and so I don't know, you may have been reading some, uh, partly I think through the governor's budget that there's a, it's contemplated that AOT may, uh, it already has changed a bit, but it may change even more um, depending, I guess, on the legislature and um, whether it wants to lean more in a direction of, um, uh, not sure to put this, how to, how, um, providing more services uh, with, uh, with fewer questions. Um, and it's it sort of tied into the whole homeless um, issue um, because the, um, a lot of the, almost all, not all, uh, a good portion of the people who come through the AOT program are homeless. And sometimes there is a concern that people are being sort of picked up off the streets and put into the AOT program um, simply to you know, to deal with homeless people. Mm -hmm. uh, but that that's a somewhat separate issue. But um, so that's kind of a summary of AOT. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Crystal. Uh, I don't think I had any comments. I think if maybe if we can go through the, the rubric to, as a reminder that this uh, project will be um, on site two days a week for 50 hours total and um, provide one-on-one -on -one service to uh, 700 anticipated individuals. 
uh, with court approved information and resources about the mental health court proceedings, um, assist in other civil um, legal like needs. So <clears throat> looking at this, this was the, the in between in terms of variance for standard deviation of where we, we, we landed um, at 11.7 for the deviation. So um, I don't know if we wanted to go through column by column or- um, Well, I, I guess I didn't really even, you know, having heard to hear what Judge Jaskell said about what the court does, but I, I guess I reflect, I kind of agree with some of the comments Jason was making earlier. I, I, I'm not quite sure what this project is gonna do to people. I mean, the public defender is representing people. Um, yeah, but the public defender, rep, you know, is representing them for their criminal matter. I mean, I've, I've, I don't know how, if Ven, the way Ventura does it is similar to LA, but there's a lot of mental health diversion and it's a team and you go in the back and you, there's a judge and the PD and the DA and an investigator, someone from behavioral health, but there's nobody, at least in my county, that's, that's helping them with these ancillary things that it looks like this is going to do. Um, overall stability, housing, um, ac accessing SSI or other benefits. So mm. that is, I was so excited when I read, read this, more excited than I think I've read about any other project because it's so badly needed. And it well, I, I don't, that it's I don't even first... suggest that I wasn't excited. I mean, I was interested yeah. too. I just wasn't quite sure what they were gonna do. So you, you view it as an assistance and accessing benefits? Yeah. I, I think they're referred to as ancillary civils or so like housing, for example, just the, the things that I rattled off just now that a lawyer can be very helpful with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Will, go ahead. Um, along the same train of thought, I in types of services provided, it lists document prep, but in the pro se document review, it states they will not be assisting litigants with preparing documents except for PAD. The PAD. That was and exciting too. Is that along the lines of what are they doing? It sounds like they're doing document prep beyond PADs, but it's only the PADs and they're not providing any document prep for the other services that Christina just mentioned. Well, I, I suppose if I mean, not document prep for filing documents in the mental health court, that's correct. They won't be doing that except the, the power of whatever it is, PAD, PA, what? Yeah, psychological advanced directive, yeah. Right. Or psychiatric, I'm not sure which one it was, but. So they will just be giving the advice in those categories that Christina was talking about. Is that my? Is that no, I think these people, these people need more than advice. Uh, I, I was envisioning they would actually be, you know, making the phone calls, filling out the documents for yeah, that. It says um, in, um, information and brief legal services um, and those range of services. With, um, with some warm handoffs, I believe as well. I'm sorry, Dan, could you say that again? I think that they also mentioned warm handoffs. The purpose of the case manager was to manage the, the transfer of any matters that work within NHAS's area of expertise to agencies that would be able to address them better. This would, this would be um, an organization that uh, does the issue spotting around everything that the court isn't actually addressing so that yeah. the problems that put the person into the court in the first place other than, than, than mental health issues uh, can be addressed. But they'll be doing that through warm referrals. They won't be doing that work themselves. I think that they said um, they would manage everything that could be managed on a uh, sort of an ad hoc walk-in basis. They're going to have um, office hours for more intensive assistance, but that they would have to hand off if it became something where a person needed representation. This is an, uh, a program for self-represented litigants. So, um, you know, there's a limit to which they can do, of which they can do, I think. Certainly, that was my understanding. It was just, I thought they were going to do document, more document prep than just the PAD. I, I, I actually can't tell that from the application. I had a question about that as well. But I do think that there's um, a, a pretty robust 
portfolio of services that they're anticipating. It looks like one staff attorney two days per week and one case manager. Um, uh, and that's on site, but I believe that they're asking for a full time attorney uh -huh. uh, and that that person's going to be, and I think that person's going to continue to work uh, in, in the office uh, I uh, see. with telephone access. However, that's a question that I think deserves some follow up. Hmm. Well, I don't think anybody could quarrel too much with the need for mental health services in Los Angeles. Um, Eric, just being mindful of the time, would it be helpful to go through the categories maybe where there's the largest variance and then sure. the review yeah. team, can the scoring team can figure out yeah. based yeah. on the situation? Okay, court involvement has um, a pretty big uh, deviation score. Uh, as well as fun <laughs> Well, that yeah, it's mostly Jason. Um, and I think I think what he said was that a lot of his concern was he wasn't quite sure what the project was going to do. Um, well, he also and this is Joe. He also noted that the the document conflates the public defender with the court, right? Right. Which obviously it isn't. And and I I shared that reaction when I read it. If you want to put down a score for me, I'd be a 15. Where would you be on project impact? I, I think a 15 as well. It sounds like a really critical need, but I think the proposal was a little vague as to what specifically they're going to do. And I, I have some question. It, it sounds like they're going to be a lot of what they're going to be doing is providing advice. And I, I wonder whether advice is what people with mental health issues really need. It, it seems they need something very hands on. And this just struck me as less hands on than um, than I would have thought might, might be most effective for dealing with that population. I, I say that, but, but we, ha we have Judge Jaskell here, and I know she's recused, but it seems that she's in a unique position to evaluate because she knows exactly what goes on in that courthouse <laughs> and, and, what, and what this proposal says. And, and I'm, I'm very afraid I'm saying something that's, that's just wrong. <laughs> no, no, I, I think... Um, you know, it's it's a new proposal. Um, this, you know, we've never had anything like this in the mental health court. The mental health court is just, you know, operated the way it's operated for however many years. Uh, this is a brand new idea. Um, and um, I think it's fair to say we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Um, I, I think the application um, did a pretty good job trying to spell some of it out, but I think some of it, you know, they'll be here. Uh, we will use them. Um, and I think uh, what what I think is a critical part of it to me is the involvement of the public defender's office, which of course is separate from the court, but um, the public defenders are the ones who have, you know, the connection with the uh, the patients uh, or the conservatives or the defendants or whatever you want to call them. And the public defender's office is very enthusiastic about working with mental health advocacy services to make sure that its clients get the, the services they need. So um, I think that it may be the strongest aspect of this proposal. Yeah, I mean, to me, I, I had never seen anything as focused on mental health and uh, as I have through this proposal, this is really pretty unique, at least in my brief experience on the commission. So I, this may be, this is one of those where I think it is maybe in my mind worth really privileging and seeding a new project, which is meeting a, a huge need. I mean, maybe it'll be great, maybe it won't, but it, it certainly seems like it has potential to me. I believe that was reflected in the innovation points um, awarded. Uh, uh -huh. It's pretty high at, at a range to, to four to six. So like maybe that's captured on um, that particular um, category. But in terms of administration, project budget, continuity planning and evaluation, 
um, does the committee feel like that this this proposal generally meets the require no. uh, meets the I expectations do. across categories? Uh, I do. I will, but I think you will get an, uh, a below for project budget if you wanted to speak to that a little bit. It's the the same issue that I've, I've seen on the other ones. They have space and other cost allocations and uh, even parking. You know, they're going to be charging for the parking. It was like all these small things where I feel like that uh, I've, it's unclear why that's necessary. You know, if they have court cooperation, they, they shouldn't have to pay for parking, and that shouldn't be such a heavy list on lift on the other cost allocations. Um, well, so parking is is quite is quite. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have all the courthouses um, in LA pretty much are like really pressed for parking space. Um, so, you know, giving somebody the privilege of parking um, in the courthouse is a big deal and it's not going to happen here. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate the clarification. I uh, didn't know that. Um, so I guess I would want, just like on the other application where I could understand the space and other cost all allocations, um, more clarity on that would help me probably move up to the six. Um, well, I don't know if you're if you're referring to concern that it's not going to be directly on site in this in the mental health court. It's going to be uh, close by in the mental health advocacy services office. Uh, and again, that's because we've outgrown this building. Um, we have no more room to squeeze anybody in here. Um, and um, I, uh, so they're they're fairly close by, is my understanding. Yeah, and, and Judge Jasko, I think we we discussed at the top of the uh, meeting that um, at or near the courthouse is less critical in. It, as it's not a requirement for these grants. Um, and, you know, given the pandemic and other uh, factors, uh, we, we understand that uh, re remote work or um, not, not being as close to the courthouse is not as critical. Um, as long as the relationship with the court uh, is high, then, then I think that that would satisfy the court involvement. Oh, issue. great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so so I think I think we understand for project budget what staff understands what what need what um, what factors would come into play for it, us to score meets or exceeds or below. Um, we have six minutes left, so I just wanted to see if we wanted to prioritize what what else we need to talk about. Uh, well, I don't know that we need to talk about evaluation or continuity planning on this one particularly. It seems like a meets to me. Um, I would just, um, for innovation, um, just wanted to confirm or like what the number is, because we had a one for public counsel for that joint um, appointment system, but um, what were the just reasons for like a, a higher points for uh, for this project? Is it, it's a new courthouse, it's um, those, okay. That I mean, that makes sense. Just something for the um, scoring team to keep in mind. Uh, funding priority, I have a feeling we'll, we'll have a put a, a fairly robust discussion on the, the scoring teams um, end, but if there's any additional insight just for this category, I think that's where it's a little bit, um, for me, like it's a little bit hard to, to gauge um, the, the committee guidance on this, uh, on this specific category. Um, Which one funding priority? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't know. I'm, I know there was not perfect agreement on this, but uh, hearing at least the majority view that we ought to incorporate project quality into this discussion. It isn't just a matter of that, that, that should be part of the, maybe a big part of the, of the way. I know not everybody agrees, but I think most people do on the call. Well, Eric, if that was in reference to me, I, I absolutely agree that it, it should be a priority and it should be a part of the rubric my understanding is the rubric was designed to assess project quality and that each piece of it was gonna reflect the project quality and that then we'd be using it to make funding priority decisions. I'm 
if, if that's wrong, and Elizabeth and Crystal can correct me if I'm wrong, I am totally willing to change my viewpoint and go with the consensus here. I mean, I, I believe that's how we applied it for 2022. Mm -hmm. I will say yeah. it was just for PG 2.0, like we didn't know if it should be considered additional considerations, but it's it's a fair point and um, the RFP and what we include in there um, as well. So I think we'll, we'll really take that to heart with the, the scoring team to, to see um, where we end up in terms of awarding points for that category and have a maybe have a discussion or we will have a discussion on February 16th. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I, I uh, agree with Crystal and Will that that's how we applied it for the 2022 grants. Um, so if, if the committee wants us to look at it differently, um, and it sounds like there's not agreement necessarily <laughs> to do that, um, I, I do think um, that once staff has reviewed the entire set, um, funding priorities will become clearer. When you say that's how we apply that, what, what did you mean by that? For the 2022 that? proposals that were approved, um, we really looked at the timing and, and years funded um, oh. as an element for funding parity. Like that was a very straight, fairly straightforward category, um, which doesn't seem to be the case this, this time around. But we will uh, definitely discuss um, just to make sure the committee is comfortable with the recommendations and make any adjustments. Um, okay. Well, this was fun. You look thrilled. Good, good sir. <laughs> well, did, let, let me ask staff, Crystal, others. I mean, we had a robust discussion, not perfect agreement. Do we have enough to work with to go forward? Oh, def definitely. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Again, the, the purpose wasn't for us all to agree. It was for us to agree on a lens on what are the criteria that we're going to be weighing and you know in the end everybody's different we have a bunch of different people involved because we want a, a variety of opinions but we want to be using the same vocabulary when we reach them and, and talk about them so that's what i think we did today <laughs> uh, and <laughs> It is a very new experience to do this across the committee because, as you know, we did this in the review team, but we did have very similar discussions when we broke up into <laughs> review teams. This is just everyone's input um, during this dedicated um, time. So appreciate everyone um, willing to, to give their justifications and being put on the spot for any outlier scores today. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, everybody. Thank you so much again for both staff and commissioners for all the time that we put into this. And the good discussion today. So look forward to uh, chatting with you more, Crystal and Danielle and all this kind of stuff and Dan and Colleen. So we'll see everybody. We'll see you. I will see you uh, soon. And for the rest of you, I guess we'll be back on February 16th, two days after <laughs> Valentine's Day. And hopefully this everybody. will be behind us. <laughs> we'll all be all right all right thanks thank thanks you. everyone thank you everybody and apologies eric no no apologies it's great thank you will <laughs> it was uh